It's funny how the mind works, isn't it? What qualifies a thought to occupy space in your head as you go about your daily life? I remember mulling over this philosophical conundrum as I sat, sipping mediocre coffee from the styrofoam cup in my hand. Maybe it was the hours spent surveilling Central Park that day, New York City's crown jewel, that had me waxing introspective. Or perhaps it was my upbringing by philosophy-enthused parents, both writers who were fascinated with human nature and the mind. My name is Baxter LaRue. Quite a rare name, right? And there I was, just another CIA operative on the job. I had been sent to New York for reasons not entirely clear to me yet. Inexplicably and almost transparently integrated into the park scenery like a particularly flavored spice in a simmering pot, there came a visceral atmosphere of terror, making my heart race. Little did I know that this feeling would lead me to unravel one of the most bizarre true crime stories this country has ever seen. It wasn't just the nature show going on around me, joggers with tight ponytails bobbing up and down, tourists taking selfies with every pigeon they encounter. That caught my attention, but also a peculiar raven-haired man, Helder Cantwell, an anthropologist specializing in North American mythology who happened to be sitting near me. We struck up a conversation that was inconsequential at first but soon our talk veered toward creatures lurking in New York's urban jungle. Central Park was beautiful that day, muggy and alive with energy. But beneath that normalcy lay an undercurrent of genuine unease. Just weeks prior, reports of grotesque attacks peppered local news sites, positioning fear squarely at the heart of this bustling metropolis. Helder mentioned having heard those stories during his studies. As dusk approached, we parted ways with a promise to meet again soon. Little did I know that our encounter would mark the beginning of my descent into an abyss of terror fueled by a creature responsible for streaks of violence the likes of which New York had never seen. Gradually, Helder and I found ourselves working together to identify the culprit behind these attacks. We spent long hours reviewing crime scene reports, bodies found shredded by inexplicable force, zigzag patterns matching no known animal species, clawing across makeshift layers. Our collaboration bloomed from happenstance to necessity, as we became increasingly entrenched in the dark world of Mausimus, a lurking American Indian creature with an uncanny thirst for destruction. The turning point came when I found myself face to face with the unhinged wrath of Malsimus. It happened late one night in a desolate corner of Central Park. Trying to move silently between tree shadows, I stumbled right into its territory, my gut sinking at the dreaded recognition of those same zigzag markings. Spatial awareness is key when facing off against an unknown adversary in pitch darkness so I kept low and moved cautiously while clutching my weapon. Suddenly, chilling growls cut through the air, sending goosebumps racing down my spine. The sound was unnervingly animalistic yet eerily human-like as well, in a way that struck me as profoundly unnatural. Not a moment later, Malsimus emerged from the gloom and charged, its eyes reflecting hatred and cunning intelligence. In a split second, our deadly dance began. Its claws swiped through the air just inches from my throat while I evaded, feeling every muscle scream against this sudden onslaught. Ultimately, with Helder's timely aid, we escaped, heartbeats pounding crazily in unison. In a state of shock and disbelief, we considered all our findings over the past few weeks in this endeavor fraught with danger and enigma. But despite our close brush with Malsimus, we realized that much remained unanswered about this creature and its motivations. Weeks later, I received word from an informant with a dubious connection to a local police chief that he knew of my experience in Central Park. Through his whispered confessions about indigenous American lore, 
chills resurfaced down my spine as the creature's murderous history was confirmed, solidifying my unwavering engagement in uncovering buried secrets. Mausimus, once nothing more than tales shared between tribes, was now an unsettling reality that I found myself enmeshed in. The ghastly play between life and death that evening still haunts my every waking moment, pushing me to piece together the sinister puzzle connecting Mausimus to the very fabric of New York City. As Helder and I continued our investigation, we delved deeper into the web of ancient myths and complex symbologies, tracing connections back through generations of mystics, deities, and power struggles between tribal cultures. We began to discover a shadowy world of secrets concealed just beneath the shimmering surface of Manhattan's urban sprawl, a tale that twisted like the labyrinthine tunnels of the city's subway system. As Baxter LaRue, this was my most demanding and enigmatic case yet, a battle against a monstrous foe wreaking havoc on the city I had sworn to protect. Every lead led to another thread in this expanding tapestry, bringing us closer to an impending darkness that threatened not only New York City but also my very sense of self. As we pressed on to confront our own demons, our personal lives became deeply intertwined with those of Mausimus, the inexplicable creature lurking at the heart of our investigation. In time, we would find ourselves racing against the ticking clock as impending doom grew steadily closer, a revelation that New York City was sitting on something far more sinister beneath its glamorous guise. Our resilience and unwavering determination would be tested time and time again as we fought to stop a force bigger than anything we had ever encountered before, an ancient malice driving Mausimus and threatening to tear the city apart from within. And faced with these monstrous truths hidden in plain sight, we would ultimately come face to face with the darkest depths of human nature itself. Life, I've come to realize, is like a game of chess. The board represents the world, with each piece a pawn in a grander scheme. And in this particular scheme, I must confess that I underestimated my opponent. I pushed the throttle of my old Ford F-150, racing down the desolate road deep within Yosemite National Park. My name is Blake O'Connor a CIA operative tackling the strange and unexplained in our world. That day was supposed to be an innocuous one, but little did I know life had other plans for me. As I took another sharp turn on the winding path amongst the tall pines, I thought back on my younger years growing up in Boston. My parents didn't know what to expect when they learned about my calling. CIA work wasn't what they had envisioned for their only son. But it had become my life's purpose and passion, unveiling the hidden mysteries lurking beneath the surface. Somber thoughts consumed me as I finally reached my destination, a meticulously planned meetup with my contact, Alex. He was supposed to get intel on illegal drug trafficking taking place by an elusive criminal organization in Mammoth Lakes Valley. No one could predict that our focus would shift so dramatically. Before stepping out of my truck, Alex greeted me with a playful jab at my unkempt hair and unbuttoned shirt. Nice tie, he teased while pretending to adjust his own imaginary knot. I chuckled before responding seriously. Let's get down to business. As we discussed strategy near a small, secluded cabin, dusk fell gently over the valley like a dark shroud signaling an end to all daylight. Slowly but surely, our banter gave way to silence as chilling whispers reached our ears from afar. What's that sound? asked Alex nervously after minutes of disquieting tension between us. Suddenly, breaking through into the clearing, came an odd creature obscured by shadows, a tall, 
humanoid figure with dark fur covering its deformed body. Its eyes gleamed a sinister red in the moonlight as it stalked toward us. We scrambled to our feet in an instant, our adrenaline pumping fiercely. In my peripheral vision, I saw the creature raise a menacing claw over Alex before pouncing without remorse. I frantically pulled out my Glock 19 and fired multiple shots, but they seemed to have no effect on the monstrous beast. Blinded by fear and confusion, I left my partner to his doom and drove off towards the nearest ranger station. At the station, I met Ranger Stan, who listened intently as I stammered out my harrowing encounter with the creature in Yosemite National Park. He had heard rumors of such a creature for years but never believed them himself. It was called the Olegicalum. As days turned into weeks, guilt settled inside me as heavy as lead. Through extensive research and heartbreaking recollections of that fateful day, we managed to piece together fragmented theories about our ghastly adversary. Ranger Stan revealed that old folklore about Olegicalum spoke of a vengeful spirit haunting those who violated nature. We arrived at the horrifying realization that the illegal drug traffickers we were after might have invoked their curse upon us all involuntarily. I made peace with myself, determined to put an end to the creature's terrorizing grip on Yosemite without deeming it too late for potential redemption. With a renewed sense of purpose and determination, I decided to confront my demons and take on the responsibility to save my fellow men. Ranger Stan and I spent countless hours poring over ancient texts and folklore to understand our adversary better. Our research led us to a sacred ritual that could potentially appease the Olegicalum and lift the curse from Yosemite National Park. Assembling a small team of experts, including linguistic scholars, cultural anthropologists, and seasoned rangers, we embarked on the most perilous journey of our lives. Trekking through the wilderness with trepidation in our footsteps, we sought out the ancient site where the spirit's wrath was first unleashed. Every rustle in the undergrowth sent shivers down our spines as we feared the creature had come for us. Prepared for an intense battle, we offered a solemn prayer to commence the ritual. The earth beneath us seemed to tremble as a deep, guttural growl echoed through the darkness. Razor-sharp claws ripped through the shadows, but this time, we stood our ground with unwavering hearts filled with resolve. What ensued was a test of courage as we fought relentlessly to rid Yosemite of its tormentor and restore balance between man and nature. I'd always found solace in the notion that life, much like the ocean, was vast and unpredictable. But never could I have imagined just how unpredictable it would become. It was June twelfth, a Wednesday, and I had been stationed in Orlando, Florida, for a seemingly innocuous assignment. As a CIA operative, you become accustomed to anything but mundanity. However, on this particular occasion, I couldn't shake the eerie atmosphere enveloping my surroundings. My name is Karsten Shellhammer. I was born and raised in Ohio and am now in my forties with a background in crime investigation. My days had become an endless blur of stakeouts and covert meetings. But as it turned out, my new mission would put all the knowledge I'd amassed to the ultimate test. My partner for this operation, Talia Winfield, had a similar background and skill set. She possessed an uncanny ability to think on her feet under pressure. While stationed in Orlando investigating local criminal organizations, we stumbled upon a series of bizarre incidents. At first, they seemed coincidental, an unfortunate run of accidents. However, as the clues mounted up and more victims appeared with inexplicable injuries and even stranger deaths, 
we began to suspect something far more sinister was at play. An anonymous informant led us toward our prime suspect, an elusive figure known throughout local folklore as the Wraith. Initially skeptical, we couldn't deny that this unidentified assailant's motives and movements lined up uncomfortably well with the chilling tales surrounding them. We dug deeper into these daunting reports, mutilated bodies with precision wounds, unexplained movements, remarkable strength, all culminating in a crescendo of evil acts that left Talia and me dumbfounded. As our investigation progressed, we found ourselves questioning our own sanity. The dark figures seemed to always be one step ahead. Were they listening in? Watching us? We scrambled to find any plausible explanation for the unnatural occurrences. One night, we finally caught our break. Orlando resident Mike, a bartender who had moved to Florida from Montana, saw the wraith while out walking after hours. Shaken, he described an ancient and monstrous figure with otherworldly agility. Mike's fear was palpable. A chill crept down my spine as we listened to his description. The next day, we decided to conduct a stakeout in the area where the wraith was last seen. Tense hours passed by, every rustle or shadow causing us to grip our weapons tighter. And then it struck. Our radio crackled painfully with the distress calls of fellow agents under attack. Horrified, we began to realize the gravity of the situation. This creature was now targeting us. Thoughts raced through my mind. How did it know? Is this retaliation? What can it do next? Pushing those fears aside, I realized that Talia and I had no choice but to confront the wraith and put an end to its reign of terror. We raced toward the carnage. Screams pierced the night air as brave men and women lost their lives in horrific ways. The scene was gruesome. We could barely make out any human remains amongst the tangled limbs and mangled flesh. With no time to waste, Talia and I followed our antagonist's path before it vanished into thin air. As the trail went cold, we stumbled upon an ancient tome gifted by a local historian, filled with fragments of information on this elusive creature. As we pieced together the wraith's origin story from the tattered pages, it became apparent that it bore a centuries-old grudge against humanity for wrongs inflicted upon it by generations past. It had begun displaying its ancient hatred by violently targeting those who now crossed its path, including us. Emboldened by our new knowledge of the foe's motives and capabilities, Talia and I prepared for the inevitable final showdown. The night was upon us once more and our enemy's bloodthirsty vengeance would wait no longer. In a heartbeat, we were engaged in a fierce and brutal battle. The wraith was every bit as horrifying as we had come to realize, its icy grip crushing bones, its guttural roars sending shivers down our spines. Though our hearts raced with fear, our minds were set on ending its reign of terror for good. Worn out by the relentless pursuit, we finally cornered the wraith in an isolated corner of the city. As the creature's moment of reckoning drew near, we steeled ourselves for the decisive confrontation. With meticulous precision, we launched an assault that struck at its very essence, exploiting the knowledge gleaned from our research. The wraith, once an unstoppable force of darkness, began to falter under our relentless barrage. As its once mighty form withered into a shadow of its former self, a sudden stillness filled the air, as if the weight of centuries of malice had finally been lifted. Talia and I exchanged a glance of grim satisfaction, knowing that we had put an end to this ancient evil once and for all. But the victory came at a cost. As we surveyed the devastation left in the race wake, it was hard not to feel an overwhelming sense of loss and sorrow for those who had become its unwitting victims. 
We dedicated ourselves to ensuring their sacrifices were not in vain by sharing our story with others in the CIA and beyond. A testament to the resilience and determination of the human spirit in the face of unspeakable horror. Our lives would never be quite the same again after that fateful encounter. The ghosts of our past would continue to haunt us from time to time. But we took solace in knowing that we had vanquished a great evil that night. In doing so, Talia and I forged an unbreakable bond, partners united by adversity who were driven to face down any threat that lay ahead of us. In the grand scheme of things, what we see is often only a fraction of reality. Sometimes, though, we might find ourselves slipping beyond the realm of what we perceive as normal, and that's when things can get truly unnerving. It was a chilly autumn evening on October 17th at Rockefeller Plaza in New York City. During my tenure with the company, I gathered enough intel to determine that a deeply sinister threat was lurking nearby. As a CIA operative in the field, it was crucial to maintain a low profile and establish connections while striving to remain inconspicuous. Still, I couldn't shake this philosophical thought from my mind. How many lives would be changed due to coincidences? A few days into my investigation, I became friendly with a reclusive shopkeeper named Alistair Beaumont. I didn't know much about him. Perhaps our sporadic conversations were the most exciting part of his routine life. One evening, after a mundane day at work, he invited me for drinks at his favorite watering hole. It took several rounds of heavy scotch before Alistair began to confess some odd occurrences in the city. People were vanishing one by one. While listening to his account, I noticed his eyes darting towards the entrance as an eerily slender silhouette approached with a hushed demeanor, Mira Grunwald. Mira infiltrated our conversation, whispering about an elusive creature called Knocknick, distinctively known for its razor-sharp claws and teeth that could tear flesh from bone in seconds. She then explained instances where it had attacked unsuspecting victims over the years by blending into darkness before making its killing move. The more I listened to their stories, the more convinced I became that all these inexplicable events were connected by a string of acts of violence executed by Knocknick. No one else seemed aware of its presence or nature. As anxiety slowly crept in, I knew I needed to alert the company to take immediate action and prevent future slaughters. The following night, I stayed behind after hours at the office to gather substantial evidence to present to my superior, Xanthus Belliris. In the dimly lit room, flickers of tension danced among the shadows as I laid out the intricate puzzle that was Knocknick's lethal pattern. With my mind caught in a frenzy, I sensed an unnerving presence behind me, only to find Alistair standing there, ashen-faced. He recounted a gruesome murder that had taken place just an hour ago near Mira's apartment. Certain that Knocknick had struck again, we decided to take action into our own hands and confront the horrific creature head-on. As we treaded through dark alleys and abandoned structures with pulsating hearts and adrenaline-fueled determination, this sinister environment only fueled our fear. We stumbled upon a scene of horror, Mira, icy and lifeless in Knocknick's embrace. Our blood ran cold as the creature hissed menacingly amidst its gnarled claws stained with her blood. Taking advantage of its momentary surprise at being discovered, we emptied our clips into its grotesque form. It released an ear-piercing shriek before dissolving into darkness once again. The search was far from over. A week passed after our harrowing encounter. Exhausted by tireless pursuits and sleepless nights, we trudged back to Alistair's store in defeat. It felt like a lifetime since things were normal. 
wordlessly serving us dark roasted brews brimming with comfortingly warm caffeine, he handed me a package delivered by an anonymous informant earlier that day. As I carefully tore the envelope apart, my eyes widened at the sight of clippings detailing multiple horrific murders across states, identical to those of Knopnik's rampage in New York City. A single photograph accompanied the grisly stories, revealing a sinister being with bones laid bare and crimson soaking its claws, a creature that looked eerily like Knocknick. A chilling realization dawned on us. Knocknick, the folklore creature we were hunting, was not a mere myth. It was a tangible monster that had plagued the U.S. for decades. Consumed by horror and disbelief, I knew the mission had become personal. The dark depths of terror we had delved into were far from over, and now vengeance for the fallen was mine to deliver. I reported our findings to the company and demanded all available resources be allocated in pursuit of Knocknick. With the blessing of Xanthus Belirus, I formed a secret task force carefully handpicking agents who had experience dealing with the supernatural and the unexplained. We found ourselves plunged into a world of darkness and terror, hunting nocturnal shadows that evaded our every attempt to apprehend them. There were whispers among us that the Knocknick was more than just one creature, but rather an entire breed of monstrous beings hellbent on spreading their reign of violence and fear. As weeks turned into months, our relentless investigations uncovered a network of cryptic messages and symbols hidden across cityscapes, revealing an underground cult that worshipped and reared these creatures as part of an ancient, unholy ritual. Our modus operandi shifted to infiltrate their ranks and destroy them from within. Constantly questioning our own sanity after nights spent stalking phantasmal beings, Sleep became elusive for all involved. It was during a raw confrontation with one of the cult's high-ranking members that Alistair revealed his true identity, a warrior from another realm sent by his ancestors to vanquish the multiplying evil that festered within the human world. Though betrayal laced his confession, his unwavering dedication to ridding the world of Knocknick solidified an unshakable bond between us. Together, we clung steadfastly to our purpose as we unraveled the twisted threads of Knocknick's dark history and severed their bloodline in a final apocalyptic battle that traversed dimensions. A ferocious storm raged within us as we emerged from the ashes, forever scarred by horrors unknown to humankind, warriors who faced death so ordinary lives could prevail in ignorance. In the deafening silence that followed our fateful encounter, I stood at Rockefeller Plaza once more, a hollow victory echoing in my heart. Even as the darkness receded, I knew that evil would always resurface, hungry for souls to devour. Alistair and I remained vigilant, united in our endless battle against the shadows that lurked just beneath the surface of reality. And every time dusk fell upon the city, we were reminded that there is far more to this world than meets the eye. Sometimes I wonder if there are things out there, lurking in the shadows, that we are not meant to understand. It's a thought that sends shivers down my spine. Last summer, in downtown Portland, I found out just how true this could be. My name's Dominic Valenti. I'm a CIA operative, and one night after work in a dimly lit bar, I was just trying to unwind with my buddy Kevin Lassiter. We were having regular banter when, out of the corner of my eye, I noticed a man hunched over at the end of the bar. That guy's been staring at his drink for hours now, murmured Kevin. As we continued to observe, we caught bits and pieces of a conversation he was having with another patron. They say it comes out around midnight. 
No one knows what it is or where it comes from, claimed the hunched man nervously. Kevin and I exchanged skeptical looks and turned our focus back on each other. But fate had other plans. Later on our way home, despite the rational thoughts in our minds, we both felt an unease that we couldn't shake off. It was nearing midnight when we heard whispers and strange noises all around us. Unable to brush it off as just our imagination, Kevin suggested we follow the trail of these eerie sensations since we both had extensive survival skills as CIA operatives. Honestly, either one of us thought anything serious would come of it, but curiosity had its grip on us. As we ventured further into an isolated alley, Kevin spotted something strange near a collection of dumpsters. We approached cautiously when suddenly my heart began pounding in my chest like never before. There, glistening in the moonlight against dark red stains on the pavement, were human bones stripped almost bare. Kevin and I exchanged horrified glances. What sick bastard could have done this? He asked, pain and fear evident in his voice. Somebody needed our help, and as trained operatives, we felt responsible for protecting innocent lives. Over the following days, we began scrutinizing CCTV footage from around the city. To our surprise, we saw a massive, black figure that seemed to emerge from the darkness itself, a creature far from legend or folklore. An unnerving pattern emerged. As the clock struck midnight, this frightening beast would materialize without fail. The series of strange attacks and disappearances became more frequent. News spread in whispers of a malevolent creature causing an unusual string of crimes. In each case, the cause of death remained unspecified, but one thing remained consistent. The mysterious creature left behind a trail much like the scene Kevin and I had stumbled upon earlier. After investigating further leads and spending many sleepless nights figuring out the identity of this horrific creature, its methods and motives remained shrouded in darkness. Keep in mind that CIA agents don't scare easily, but it was petrifying not having any idea what threat could be lurking in every shadowy corner. As we continued piecing together clues, I finally got my hands on a dusty folklore book that mentioned a creature called Goritra, an elusive entity known only to ancient Native American tribes in the area. Its destructive capacity and insatiable appetite for human flesh were recorded on poorly preserved parchment pages. The knowledge gleaned from that book was bittersweet. While it gave us an idea of what we were dealing with, there was still no way to predict when or where this creature would strike again. It wasn't until weeks later, when I visited a coffee shop and overheard two old men discussing local legends, that I found something closer to understanding Goratrok's identity. One of them mentioned his son worked for emergency services and swore someone anonymously gave him details about this ancient beast's origin but claimed it would only bring more devastation if disclosed. We never found the antagonist of this chilling tale. The endless whiff of danger and suspicion lingered in every dark alley of downtown Portland as we continued searching for answers. Years passed, and my memory began to fade, but every once in a while, I am reminded of that spine-chilling time when I witnessed firsthand how close the line exists between the logical, mundane world we live in and the one inhabited by creatures like Goratrok. Little did Kevin and I know that during those nights, while hunting for answers and justice, we were also being hunted. To this day, I sometimes find myself glancing over my shoulder, paranoid that something lurks in the shadows. I have tried to put those horrifying experiences behind me and refocus on my work as a CIA operative, but I can never shake off that itch deep down, the pressing need for closure and justice that keeps me awake at night. Even now, as I sit in my apartment in a city far from Portland, 
I still wonder if Gorotrak is out there somewhere, continuing its ghastly pursuits in some terrifying half-world that lies just beyond our understanding. The events of that summer changed me as a person and an operative. Kevin and I no longer discuss what took place. We both know it only stirs up dark old fears best left buried under layers of daily concerns. The one thing that haunts me even more than the existence of such a creature is the knowledge that there are almost certainly others like it, lurking in the shadows of our world, waiting to reveal themselves when we least expect it. These furtive thoughts follow me into the depths of my work, becoming a constant reminder that there are things we cannot, and perhaps should not, unravel. Is it then better to seek understanding of these monsters or resign ourselves to acknowledging their existence while continuing to live each day as fully as possible? In times of solace and inner reflection, I am confronted by these questions, ones with no immediate answers, only echoes of fear left behind by Gorotrak's shadow. It's fascinating how the most unsettling moments in life can spring from the most ordinary situations. I remember that day back in 2008 like it was yesterday, pondering while sipping my coffee at a cafe in downtown Manhattan about life's intangible nature, never knowing what was to come. My name is Jackson Stanfield, and I've been with the CIA for around eight years. I was in New York City on an unrelated assignment, but little did I know that my life would change so drastically by simply visiting a popular tourist spot. It was already late in the afternoon, around 4.30, when I came across the entrance to Central Park. The air buzzed with energy as people went about their lives, laughing and talking carelessly. One of my colleagues, Maxwell Reed, met me near the Alice in Wonderland statue. We exchanged pleasantries and began our casual stroll around the park while discussing updates from headquarters. As we walked by the pond, we noticed a man angrily arguing with his friend a few feet away. I'm telling you, Jay, something's lurking around here. Just last week, it took old Mrs. Mosley's dog, he shouted. Jay rolled his eyes and replied sarcastically, What is it now? A werewolf? A giant foot? Just drop it already! Not thinking much of it, Max and I moved on, as we still had a lot to cover during our outing. Over the next hour or so, however, things started to feel off. The sounds of footsteps appeared to be following us from a distance. We could have sworn we heard whispers behind bushes, but we found no one there when we searched. Maxwell generally had nerves of steel, but had begun to feel uneasy and suggested that we should head back. As darkness approached and we started heading towards the exit, we stumbled upon a gruesome scene. Jay lay motionless on the ground, his limbs twisted at unnatural angles. There was no sign of the other man. Shocked, I pulled out my weapon, scanning the surroundings for any inkling of danger. Maxwell and I stayed silent, listening intently to the eerie silence, our hearts pounding in our chests. Suddenly, from behind a tall tree emerged a creature standing over seven feet tall, with mangled hair and eyes void of any emotion. Seemingly intelligent and purposeful, it clutched Jay's lifeless body and disappeared into the darkness. Our training kicked in as we split up to find more clues about this enigmatic creature. It wasn't hard to follow the blood trail that led us to a small, hidden cave north of Central Park. The lair was filled with bones and gruesome remains, indicating multiple victims over an extensive period of time. Scouring through old newspaper archives later revealed that there had been numerous unsolved missing person cases within the park's vicinity. 
As we continued our investigation, Maxwell stumbled upon an old journal from the 1800s that narrated the stories of a tribal shaman named Talatuk who had taken refuge in the wilderness after being cast out for dabbling in dark magic. According to the tales, it was believed that he had transformed into this horrific beast who now hunted his prey under the cover of darkness. Armed with this new information, we reported back to headquarters and coordinated an extensive manhunt for Talatuk, or whatever it truly was. The cave was excavated for evidence and eventually sealed off, but tension remained high as every strange noise or sudden shadow would send chills down our spines. Till this day, no one knows what happened to the creature, whether it still roams Central Park under new guises or perhaps has found a different hunting ground altogether. The unsettling legacy it left behind will continue to haunt us for years to come. Despite the relentless efforts of both local law enforcement and our specialized CIA task force, the Central Park creature had seemingly vanished without a trace. The events that unfolded that chilling evening marked a turning point in my career, shifting my focus to the investigation of otherworldly entities and paranormal occurrences, often dismissed as myths or urban legends. I convinced Maxwell to become my partner in this pursuit, gathering intelligence on mythological beings and supernatural phenomena around the world. Over the years, we've encountered formidable adversaries, creatures born of ancient magic, cursed beings seeking redemption, and even those with intentions so sinister they shake us to our core. But no matter what dangers we face or how close we come to death, we remain committed to understanding this hidden world, pursuing each case relentlessly despite our constant unanswered questions. All the while, the memory of the Central Park Beast still looms over us like a specter from a forgotten nightmare, shaping our lives with its unforgettable presence and pushing us deeper into a rabbit hole of mystery and intrigue. Jackson Stanfield and Maxwell Reed have now become synonymous with unearthing that which lies beneath the surface, shining light on chilling tales of terror lurking in the shadows, only to be whispered about under covers in the dead of night. The horrifying encounter that once shook young CIA agents has now become legendary among those who dare to delve into realms unknown. And as they embark on new adventures, Tackling sinister plots and unspeakable creatures from beyond, a quiet unease continues to remain, for no one can truly predict when or where this malevolent being may once again emerge from the darkest corners of our reality. I've always wondered if there's a force in this world just waiting for the right moment to strike. A predator is waiting in the shadows, watching its prey. Do we make fate, or does it make us? I never thought I'd have a personal experience that made me ponder these questions until the summer of 2013. I'm Steve Ackerman, a CIA operative currently working out of New York City. My team and I were sent to New Orleans to monitor a high-level target involved in illegal arms dealing. We'd rented a safe house near Bourbon Street, perfect for observing the comings and goings of our mark. One evening meeting took place at a small bar named The Devil's Drum. Nothing fancy, just an excuse for my team to unwind after poring over reconnaissance photos all day. At the bar, we shared some beers, even making a toast to Bridget, our communications expert, who had just celebrated her birthday. Across from us sat an older man named Randy Jackson, one of those local guys that everyone seemed to know. He told us he had been fishing in the Lake Pontchartrain area his entire life. He listened to our fake cover story about a group of friends on vacation, and shared a few jokes about tourists invading his city. As we moved into our second round of drinks, 
we noticed something odd happening outside. On the once busy street facing the bar's entrance, an eerie quiet settled, like everyone had just vanished into thin air. We exchanged puzzled glances before Randy spoke up. You folks should head back to your lodgings, he said cautiously. There's something not right about tonight. Of course, we ignored him at first, as we were trained agents with years of experience between us. But after witnessing another strange occurrence, all the streetlights flickering simultaneously, we took his advice. Back at the safe house, during a debriefing from Alex Kessler, our intelligence specialist, we learned that a string of random disappearances had occurred in the city. Disturbingly, these incidents all seemed to center around Lake Pontchartrain. As dedicated as we were to our mission, we couldn't shake a feeling of genuine fear and vulnerability for the locals, so we decided to investigate discreetly. My gut told me they could be connected to our target. We started scrutinizing recent surveillance footage for any connections. Weeks passed, and my squad had uneasily settled into a routine, addressing our CIA priorities and researching these strange occurrences on the side. Some members even grew increasingly paranoid. Alex and I stepped out in the wee hours of the morning one night to conduct some reconnaissance near the lake. We spotted an unfamiliar shape in our high-resolution binoculars, a hulking creature emerging from the dark water near a man who was fishing diligently. The beast pounced on him and dragged him underwater. It was both brutal and swift, an unmistakably unnatural assailant. Over time, and with countless strategic observations and discreet interrogations of locals, we stumbled upon whispers of an ancient folklore figure, Ruguru, half-man, half-wolf, rampaging through time for centuries. Its notorious hunting grounds? Lake Pontchartrain. We hatched one final plan to confront this creature under the guise of an innocent fishing trip. Randy might have suspected something but tagged along regardless. Crouched on the boat at twilight, my gun at the ready, I prayed a silent plea that our makeshift traps would help us capture this seemingly immortal fiend or at least offer some closure for the terrified citizens. As I glanced back at Randy's grizzled face while he baited his hook, I knew he understood the stakes more than any of us ever could. The climax came sooner than expected, as it emerged from below with animalistic rage. To this day, I can't adequately describe its visage or intentions, but that night remained seared into my mind. A symphony of gunfire echoed through the air as each member of my team fought for their lives. Ultimately, Randy perished in the fray, a valiant soul we will always remember. We couldn't vanquish the Ruger completely, and it escaped back into the water's depths. With our cover blown, we left New Orleans. Before heading out, I encountered a priest who explained that our survival was nothing short of a miracle. The creature we'd battled would remain an enigma, forever entwined within Cajun lore and the fabric of New Orleans itself. As the years went by, I continued my career with the CIA, but that summer in Louisiana always lingered in the back of my mind. The fateful encounter we had experienced left a lasting impact on how I perceived my own line of work. I began to question not only the supernatural forces at play but also humanity's greatest obstacles, our insatiable curiosity, resistance to fear, and perseverance in the face of the unknown. While our mission itself was deemed unsuccessful by our superiors, it united my team in an unspoken bond that could never be broken. We often found solace in sharing stories of that harrowing night with disbelief etched onto the faces of those who couldn't fathom what we had been through. It's odd how an extraordinary and terrifying phenomenon rekindled my sense of faith in humanity's untold resilience and adaptability. To this day, 
I find myself drawn to Lake Pontchartrain whenever I return to New Orleans, staring into its murky depths and wondering what other mysteries lurk beneath the surface, waiting for unsuspecting souls to confront them. But as long as there are individuals who challenge these fearsome entities and stand their ground against forces beyond human comprehension, there is hope for humanity's survival amidst the chaos and uncertainty that is our world. I couldn't help but ponder the age-old philosophical question, are we inherently drawn to our own destruction? I mulled over this thought while meandering through the bustling streets of New Orleans, enjoying a rare break from my duties as a CIA operative. It was mid-May 1986, and the city was buzzing with life, like it always had. My name is Cassius Devereaux. I was born and raised in Savannah, Georgia, by my Creole mother and Cajun father. My unique upbringing provided me with skills that eventually led me to a career in one of America's most discreet and intriguing organizations. It all started one blurry night at Pat O'Brien's infamous bar. I'd ordered a hurricane when a local sitting next to me struck up a conversation. Hey there, you must be new around here drawled the man, whom I later learned was named Matteo Fournier. Yeah, I'm just passing through, I replied. Matteo was a talkative sort, regaling us with stories about his life and experiences in New Orleans. As the night went on and inhibitions were loosened by the liquor, our conversation took an eerie turn. That's when he mentioned it, Remy Girl, an obscure folklore creature said to inhabit certain parts of Louisiana's bayous, known for stalking and hunting unsuspecting victims in remote communities. Back then, I dismissed Mateo's words as the nonsensical ramblings of a drunken man. How could such an absurd tale hold any merit? However, it wasn't long before my skepticism diminished with each passing day in New Orleans. Inconspicuous news reports speckled the papers. Missing locals were found mutilated and scattered throughout nearby swamps. The savage reality surrounding these ghastly events started to gnaw at me. As an agent trained to spot irregularities, my instincts knew these were not mere acts of any human or animal. The situation intensified as I encountered a shattered woman on the brink of insanity desperately whispering about Remy Girl and its horrifying features. She had been witness to her husband's brutal demise, barely escaping with her life. Her fragmented description of the creature sent chills up my spine, and it matched hints in those same newspaper reports. A potential connection was becoming clear. I scrambled to investigate deeper, contacting my buddies in law enforcement and gathering information about these gruesome incidents. The pieces eventually formed the vivid image of a hideous predator with deceptively human-like features but an insatiable hunger for blood and violence. Unwilling to share this with unprepared individuals, my newfound friend Matteo joined me in this hair-raising mission to uncover the truth behind Remy Girl. Tensions rose as we encountered disturbing scenes of carnage perpetuated by an evolutionarily advanced monster that humbled even us seasoned professionals. Our chase dragged us deep into labyrinthine bayous. Twisting waterways and misladen air obscured our surroundings, and our hearts pounded as we struggled to overcome obstacles and make split-second decisions to survive. In the whirlwind of madness and despair, we managed at last to confront Remy Girl, exposed but unrepentant, just as an impenetrable darkness fell upon the bayou. It smirked at us with unnerving malice through blood-soaked lips, then vanished into the shadows. Dread permeated our bones as we stood there alone. When we emerged from that unhinged nightmare, local authorities were baffled by our testimonies. 
Reports of carnage ceased mysteriously after our encounter, but in private conversations, whispers mentioned a chilling source behind Remigirl's conception. Perhaps he didn't vanish entirely but simply retreated into another form, unseen, waiting for more victims to cross his path when least expected. As I left New Orleans marked by the haunting experience, I realized that no matter what I might uncover through my investigations or which of my assumptions proved correct, the world is immersed in impenetrable shadows that leave you only with more questions than answers. It seemed that the threshold between reality and folklore was frighteningly thin, and it was there that creatures like Remigirl thrived. In the years that followed my encounter with Remigirl, I found myself drawn to the world of folklore and cryptids. My position in the CIA provided me with numerous opportunities to travel, and so I began an unofficial investigation as both a personal obsession and to ensure national security from unknown threats. Conducting a covert struggle against unnatural forces became my true life's mission. Across continents and cultures, my trail of whispered stories led me along a path of terror that served as an unexplored underbelly of our reality. I came face to face with beings whose existence challenged everything I knew about our world. From the depths of Loch Ness to the harsh forests of Siberia, the enthralling legends suddenly pulsed with life when confronted firsthand. Nightmares crawled up from the darkest recesses of human imagination to manifest as flesh and bone monsters lurking just out of you. As I unraveled truth from myth, uncanny connections emerged among these elusive enigmas, like pieces falling into place in a horrific jigsaw puzzle. Fearsome creatures seemed to possess an uncanny intelligence that both thwarted and taunted those who dared tread in their shadows. Yet something drove me further into this horrifying reality. The very darkness that threatened to consume me only served to strengthen my resolve. To fight such extraordinary evil, I knew I had to become its match and learn how it slithered across continents undetected by mankind. And so, armed with this knowledge, equal parts dangerous and enlightening, I embarked on a journey that would take me through treacherous terrain and harrowing encounters, guided by faint whispers from ancient traditions. And always, just beyond the edge of illumination cast by flickering flames or dim moonlight, Remigirl's twisted silhouette would appear as if mocking my every step. It was more than mere obsession now. It was a battle for survival between humanity and an ancient force that fed on our fear and suffering. Deep inside, I knew that our confrontation in the bayou had not been our last, and only my unyielding determination could stand as a bulwark against the encroaching shadows of Remigirl's ruthless reign. I was on patrol in the park, as usual, when I stumbled upon something that would forever change my life. It was Thursday afternoon, around 4 p.m., and the air felt as if it were charged with an eerie energy. My name is Tate Whirlwind, a Sioux native park ranger who has worked in this vast wilderness for the past five years. As I traversed the remote trails where not many hikers ventured, I came across an odd scene. You've got to be kidding me, said my best friend and fellow ranger, Zephaniah Ghostbear, who had been assigned to accompany me that day. Lying at our feet was a deer carcass, but not just any deer carcass. This particular one seemed like it had been through a blender. Zeph felt the same creepy vibe that had been lingering in the air since we started our hike. We continued our patrol but eventually decided to return to base as night approached. Just as we were about to call it a day, we received a call over our radios from Ranger Calliope Shade. A family of hikers had not returned from their journey, and the report mentioned an unusual sense of dread. 
Armed with flashlights and worried expressions, Zeph and I searched into the night. We rounded a bend in the trail and saw belongings scattered all over. Clothes, shoes, gear. We both felt the panic rise in us. Something unsettling had happened here. Suddenly, from nowhere, we heard a gut-wrenching wail echo through the trees. It wasn't human or animal-like. It was unearthly. A split-second decision led us further into the darkness towards that dreadful sound. As we crept along cautiously, we soon came across what could only be described as an abomination of nature. It stood roughly nine feet tall and resembled nothing I had ever seen before. Its skin was horrifically disfigured, and blood dripped from open, festering wounds. Its eyes burned with an intense malevolence, as if it were a predator hunting its prey. It snarled and lunged forward. Zeph and I barely managed to dodge the creature's powerful swipe. The beast was relentless, leaping and snarling like a wild animal, taking out chunks of trees in the process. We were getting tired, but this thing showed no signs of slowing down. In the heat of the moment, Zeph drew out his knife and slashed at the creature, landing a deep cut across its chest. To our amazement, it recoiled with an ear-piercing shriek. We had found its vulnerability. It could be hurt. The adrenaline-fueled battle raged on for what felt like hours. Though battered and bruised, we managed to subdue the beast long enough to escape back to base, reeking of fear and sweat. No one else needed to know our tale. This was our harrowing secret. Zeph and I agreed never to speak of it again. It wasn't until several days later that Zeph received a call from his friend, who worked at the local historical society. She told him about the creature from American folklore she'd come across while sorting through some old books, a terrifying being that fit the exact description of our nearly fatal encounter that night. Its name? Neither of us could remember hearing it before, but we knew one thing for sure, that monstrous creature would haunt us for as long as we lived and its name would remain steeped in mystery as an eternal reminder of the horrors lurking in the shadows. As weeks turned into months, the chilling encounter with the otherworldly creature faded into the background of our lives. Zeph and I continued our duties as park rangers, quietly carrying the weight of that terrifying secret. One day, while patrolling a different section of the park, we discovered a series of old ruins hidden behind a cluster of trees. This ancient site sent shivers down our spines, as though it were connected to the nightmare we had faced. Driven by curiosity and a sense of responsibility, we began investigating the ruins and their history in our spare time. Our quest for knowledge led us to uncover startling truths about the park's past and unearth similar tales of gruesome encounters reported over the centuries. Slowly, we realized that otherworldly forces might still be at work within these woods, manipulating the fabric of reality. As we delved deeper into the mystery, Seth and I grew increasingly wary of sharing our findings. We felt compelled to keep others from facing what we had survived that fateful night, lest they be confronted with a fate far worse than ours. We became vigilant protectors of the park's secrets, seeking to understand and confront its darkness on our own terms. And although we never encountered that horrifying creature again, we remained ever watchful. Eerie whispers in the wind and unexpected shadows kept us rooted to our mission. In time, other rangers joined our ranks as word spread about strange occurrences within the park's boundaries. Together, we formed an unspoken alliance dedicated to protecting people from unseen terrors lurking in the wilderness. But deep down, Zeph and I knew that this was more than just an occupational hazard or an unsolved mystery. This was a glimpse into another world a universe where monsters truly exist and prey upon the human spirit. The nameless being from our past would forever bind us together as custodians,
guarding against the unearthly horrors beyond our understanding. We would no longer be ordinary park rangers. We were now stewards at the gates of the dark realms. Why am I here? I remember sitting in that old cabin with the weight of that question on my chest. It was November 23rd, 2004, just after sundown, and my buddy Lucas and I had arrived to spend a long weekend hunting and fishing in the remote Appalachian backwoods. We've been looking forward to this trip for months now. A getaway from our mundane lives, living the wilderness dream, if only for a moment. The cabin belonged to my estranged Uncle Troy, who had recently passed away. I hadn't seen him since childhood, but he was kind enough to leave it to me in his will. I met Lucas back when we both studied electrical engineering together at the State University. He worked as my lab partner and soon became one of my best friends. He brought with him a zest for adventure that only someone who grew up seeing brown bears in their backyard could have. Yeah, Lucas had a different background than most of us. He grew up somewhere in the wilderness of Alaska before moving southward for college. As we unpacked our gear and settled in for the evening, I found an old game of poker cards that seemed untouched for years and suggested we play a few games before turning in. And so we did, laughing, chatting about mutual friends, and drinking from this ridiculously old bottle of whiskey we found stashed away. Around midnight, when our laughter carried into the still air outside the cabin's perimeter, and we couldn't hear it anymore, there came a cracking sound above us, breaking branches followed by heavy footsteps on the roof. Both of us froze instinctively. Moments later, there was an eerie silence that held our breaths hostage. Suddenly it struck me like a ton of bricks, that fateful day six months prior when Uncle Troy was found dead on his property with his dogs mauled beyond recognition. The police had said wild animals, but something felt off about the report. Could this have been happening when he was killed? I whispered to Lucas who by now had turned a shade paler. The footsteps returned. My heart raced as we heard shuffling sounds outside the cabin, apparently something a lot more menacing now. I began to rack my brain for some explanation of who or whatever was outside. Locking up the cabin in dead silence, we nervously decided to stay put until the morning to devise a plan. Little sleep found us that night. As daylight broke, Lucas ventured out cautiously to check for tracks and assess the situation while I went through an old shoebox of Uncle Troy's belongings. Inside it, I stumbled upon a crumpled letter from one of his neighbors warning him about strange disappearances and aggressive acts by an alleged group of hillbillies in those woods. Before I could make sense of it, Lucas called me outside. He had found something he needed me to see, tracks leading off into the distance. The prints belonged to two sets of boots, one massive in size and another smaller and following closely behind. The bigger one trailed deep claw marks beside each powerful impression in the soft ground. We decided it was best to follow these tracks to unravel this mystery that seemingly surrounded Uncle Troy's death. A feeling of dread filled me with each step we took further towards what might end up being our own doom. But what other choice did we have? The tracks led us deeper into the woods until they stopped abruptly at a hidden clearing surrounded by menacing thorns and bushes covered with rotting animal carcasses from past hunting efforts. Here, we suddenly stumbled upon grisly evidence, a makeshift camp adorned with long, decomposed bodies hanging from trees like morbid trophies. Our hearts sank at this horrific discovery when, out of nowhere, an otherworldly roar echoed through the air, and we knew whoever was responsible was watching us from beyond the shadows. 
As we sprinted back to the cabin, barely escaping with our lives, Lucas would later tell me the hillbilly's name was Jack, Mad Dog, Hoover, a monstrous recluse with a deranged protege he was said to have been training to follow in his twisted footsteps. We never found out who exactly his protege was. But with the police finally showing up on my frantic 911 call, I couldn't shake off an awful question. Was this archaic horror story, this tormenting head trip, really over? As the investigation ensued and the gruesome details unfolded, Lucas and I found ourselves spiraling into an uneasy paranoia. As the police combed through the woods searching for clues, we were stuck in the cabin with our now disturbing memories of Mad Dog's lair. Sleep became a fleeting luxury as nightmares haunted our dreams, leaving us drenched in cold sweat each night. As weeks turned into months, our daily conversations quickly devolved into conspiracy theories about the true identity of Jack Hoover's elusive protege, a relentless specter that consumed our minds and disrupted what was left of our peace. Unable to find solace or safety any longer in those hills, we sold the cabin and went our separate ways, feeling like fugitives from our own past. The fear of Hoover's protege never left us. Instead, it grew into an obsession that ate away at any semblance of normalcy or hope for salvation. In time, we'd lose touch due to a mutual longing to escape this terrible secret we both shared. Yet every now and then, I would catch a hollow glance from a stranger on the street or hear an unsettling whisper just beyond my line of sight, a stark reminder that the twisted ghosts of Jack, Mad Dog, Hoover and his unidentified protege still lurk amidst the shadows, waiting for their moment to re-enter my life and strike again. You know, it's funny how life takes unexpected turns in the blink of an eye. There I was. Chaska Blackhawk, just your ordinary park ranger at a national park in the United States. I never imagined that making a simple career choice would lead me to experience something so horrifying that most people could never begin to comprehend it. My day started like any other. It was just after sunrise when I began my morning patrol through the park. The birds were singing, and the world seemed at peace completely unaware of the darkness lurking beneath the surface. But if there's one thing I've learned over the years, it's that our world is far more mysterious than we'd ever like to admit. As a Creek Native American, I grew up with stories my elders shared about creatures from ancient folklore. However, these tales always felt like campfire stories meant to instill fear and caution in younger generations. They never struck me as actual facts. About halfway through my daily route, I encountered a group of campers who became fast friends during their stay at the park. Greg was a lanky redhead with blue eyes and an infectious laugh, while his girlfriend Sarah was considerably shorter with dark hair and bright green eyes brimming with curiosity. Mark, a muscular ex-soldier with ash blonde hair, never seen phased by anything. The four of us continued together on my patrol when we reached one of the isolated clearings deep within the forest. It felt eerily quiet there, no chirping birds or rustling leaves around us. But besides this creepy feeling in my gut, everything seemed perfectly fine. We set out for a nearby camping spot, intending to have lunch altogether when Sarah picked up an odd-looking twig on the forest floor. At least she thought it was just a typical twig, but then we looked closer and realized it wasn't wood at all. Instead, it appeared to be composed of another unfamiliar material, something like a hair-like extension or long, coiled tendon. Concerned, I suggested we take it to the park office for further examination. Heading back, Time seemed to slow down, 
and a sense of unease settled upon me as I pondered what we'd discovered. Our friendly banter gradually grew silent as the feeling of impending danger intensified. Rounding a bend in the path, my heart nearly stopped when I saw fresh bloodstains and torn clothing chillingly similar to what Mark had been wearing earlier that day. Horrified, my initial thoughts were that it was just an unfortunate accident, maybe an animal attack. Sarah and Greg flagged down a passing park ranger and were shocked to hear about a series of bizarre disappearances in the area involving campers vanishing without a trace. The tattered clothing suddenly made no sense to me, and there was no way Mark could have moved fast enough to shed those clothes willingly. We asked if they had any information about the strange twig-like object we've discovered. The other ranger told us that online forums had come up with various theories about the Minnesota Iceman, an elusive entity rumored to cause mysterious mutilations in animals and disappearances around the park. None of this made any sense, until that very night, when events took an even darker turn when a guttural scream pierced our ears while we sat around a campfire trying to make sense of everything. The forest air was thick with malevolence as we realized an evil force was stalking our steps. I'll never forget how it looked, its body covered in slick and twisted fibers resembling human hair that changed color with each passing shadow among the branches above. Long and sharp claws adorned with glistening goo that dripped from its talons were blood but perhaps worst of all was its leering gaze. Two bottomless pits where eyes should have been, darkness staring out at us before it lunged in for the attack with lightning speed. I'm not sure how we escaped that night yet we came out alive. Sarah lost an arm, and Greg would never walk again. Me? The scars on my body are as much a testament to the horror we'd faced as they were to the mental scars left after our ordeal. We thought it was over, but I knew then that something evil haunted these woods and might continue doing so for generations to come. Only months later did I learn from local reports about an old resident sharing stories of a mythical creature known as the Shadow Viper, and their community believed to be responsible for all those acts. The fear and fascination surrounding the legend of the Shadow Viper seemed to spread throughout the park like wildfire. Visitors would come not only to enjoy the scenic beauty but also cautiously hope for a chance to catch a glimpse or hear tales of the monstrous creature that haunted the park. People often came up to me, along with other rangers, with questions or their own stories they had heard. Of course, none of us would admit to the encounter my group had experienced. We held on to the hope that it was a one-time event, something we could bury in our pasts. Over time, though, it became increasingly challenging to deny the evidence that began piling up, torn tents, strange markings on trees surrounding campsites, and chilling recordings of an unnerving growl echoing through the forest. The park services established a task force to investigate and assess the potential threat, if there really was one, lurking among those wooded paths. I couldn't help but be drawn into their investigation. After all, I needed closure and answers for myself as much as I needed to protect others from the unspeakable horror I had witnessed. As we delved deeper into our research and uncovered long-forgotten documents about ancient legends passed down from generation to generation among local tribes, we began unraveling a pattern concealed within these stories. There seemed to be a cyclical nature to the creature's existence. It would emerge for a brief moment in time, causing widespread chaos before vanishing again, giving enough time for fear and memories of its atrocities to fade away before returning once more. Realizing that we might have a chance at anticipating its future appearances, my team and I became even more dedicated in our efforts. We worked tirelessly collecting data and preparing for what felt like an inevitable confrontation with this ancient terror. 
As we neared our predicted date for when it would resurface, our park dealt with an entirely different problem. Missing person cases seemed to be increasing at an alarming rate. Unsettling questions lingered in our minds. Were these disappearances the early signs of the Shadow Viper's return? Or had it perhaps never left and was simply growing bolder in its actions as it recognized our attempts to combat its evil? The burden of knowledge weighed heavily on us all. As we dug deeper, we hoped for a way to cast out this lurking shadow and restore peace to a place that represented the beauty and wonder of untouched nature. It was late on a Friday night in the heart of Manhattan, and the air was thick with the smell of cheap fast food and expensive perfume. New York City was humming like a well-oiled machine, as it always did, but what really made this night stand out was me, Tim Foster, your average 30-something accountant who chose to blow off some steam after a grueling work week. The evening started well enough. I made my way through local bars with friends, enjoying cold brews and sharing laughs. The last thing I remember is that we were at Murphy's Joint near Union Square. I said goodbye to my now wobbly companions around 2 a.m. before stumbling towards the subway station to catch my ride home. As I swayed down the sidewalk, fighting off impending vertigo, I noticed something peculiar. A young couple approached me at an odd time for pedestrians considering the hour. It wasn't until they got closer that the unsettling chill began to crawl up my spine. They were just kids, teenagers, maybe 14 or 15. But those eyes are black and soulless, like a pair of obsidian stones. Hey, mister, the boy said in an eerily calm voice. Do you have a light? His name was Simon Bryce, a name that still haunts me to this day. I paused for a moment, reluctantly fumbling through my pockets before handing over my lighter. There was something unnerving about these kids that I couldn't put my finger on. Was it their unseasonal black clothing? Their odd request? Or maybe it was seeing two kids roaming around this late at night? As Simon lit his cigarette, and handed it to the girl beside him, Eliza Crawford. Whispers reached our corner of the street. A group of four men in hooded jackets had rounded into view. We shouldn't be here, Eliza murmured nervously under her breath. I looked back at them, then back at the approaching group, sensing an impending danger I couldn't understand. My instincts told me to leave immediately. But as I watched the others draw closer, I knew I couldn't abandon these two young souls. Tensions escalated rapidly when one of the hooded men lunged forward, grabbing Simon by the collar forcefully. They demanded money, and fearing for their lives, Eliza pulled out her wallet and handed over some cash. But it wasn't enough to satisfy their sick appetites. Out of nowhere, Simon let out a guttural growl, and his eyes darkened further. In one swift movement, he lunged towards the attacker with inhuman speed and strength. The sound of bones crunching and screams filled my ears as Eliza revealed a wicked grin. Panicked shouts from other pedestrians echoed down the street with each vicious attack from those no longer innocent kids. It felt like being ensnared in a nightmare. Part of me wanted to run far away from this horror show, but another part was frozen in place, unable to comprehend what was unfolding before me. Finally, the hooded men lay lifeless on the ground, their bodies mutilated beyond recognition by Simon and Eliza. The taste of bile mixed with sheer terror crawled up my throat as they turned back to face me. Eliza casually took one last drag from her cigarette before flicking it into the carnage beside us. The scent of burning fabric reached my nostrils as she leaned in close to my ear and whispered chillingly, Thank you for the light. 
Without another word, they disappeared into the darkness together, leaving behind a trail of death and unanswered questions that still haunt me to this day. Weeks later, I found myself glued to an online article about Simon Bryce and Eliza Crawford, a pair of runaway teenage sociopaths who were suspected in a series of grisly murders across the country, leaving a trail of darkness wherever they went. Their demented rampage continued, even after my own encounter. And despite the nationwide manhunt, they were never caught. To this day, I am haunted by their names, Simon Bryce and Eliza Crawford. I wonder what horrors they unleashed upon others and if I could have somehow prevented them. But most of all, I wonder about their chilling eyes, those obsidian pools, and pray that I'll never see them again. Years have passed since that terrifying encounter, but the fear and shock of that night cast a harrowing shadow over my present life. Tim Foster, the once fearless and fairly amiable accountant, has grown a paranoid shell of a man. I started attending support groups for surviving victims of violent acts, desperately seeking solace and ways to cope with the overwhelming guilt. In the confessional calm of these meetings, I found a kindred spirit in Janet Halloway, a woman who also encountered Simon and Eliza on a hauntingly dark night quite similar to mine. Over coffee and shared nightmares, we began to piece together fragments of Simon and Eliza's origin story, desperate to find an answer to our perpetual torment. As Janet and I delved deeper into the lives of our tormentors, we stumbled upon whispers of a secret society known as the Children of the Eclipse, an order believed to have groomed young minds like Simon and Eliza with a twisted worldview and supernatural abilities. While skeptics dismissed these claims as mere urban legend, some claimed this group wielded power far beyond anything comprehensible to ordinary people. It was during this investigation that Janet suggested an idea both thrilling and treacherous. What if we were able to penetrate this enigmatic society, expose their sinister intentions, and bring justice to their victims, including ourselves? Though the idea sent chills down my spine, I was unable to resist the all-consuming desire for answers. Our decision transported us down an ever-darkening path where the lines between good and evil blurred beyond recognition. We submerged ourselves in the world of clandestine meetings in abandoned churches and secret rituals under bone-white moonlight, gambling with time, our sanity, and our lives to hold back this malevolent tide threatening humanity. Whether searching for redemption or retribution, Janet and I became unlikely warriors in a battle against darkness, hoping one day we would conquer our demons, both within and around us. Little did we know, even deeper secrets awaited us, eclipsing the truth we so desperately sought. I never really thought about how fragile life could be until it was staring me in the face. It's funny how we can walk around, confident that our day-to-day -day routine is safe and controlled, while lurking in the shadows are the unknowns that can change everything. My name is Jasper Contise, a 37-year-old accountant from Spokane, Washington. I've always been a logical sort of guy trusting in the guarantees of numbers and concrete facts. That Tuesday in March, however, taught me that sometimes logic just doesn't add up. A group of old friends invited me to go camping at Mahogany Campground, a well-known spot to unwind after tax season had come to a close. So, with eager anticipation and laughter over shared memories of camping trips gone wrong, we set out on a weekend retreat that would be far different from any before. We had set up camp and were enjoying cold beers after an afternoon hike when Jack busted out some fancy imported cigars he'd been saving for the occasion. 
with everyone getting nicely buzzed, it was easy to laugh off the strange noises echoing through the trees as nothing more than nature doing its thing. Physically exhausted but not wanting to call it an early night, we gathered around the campfire, swapping stories. When my good friend Marilyn confessed apprehensively about smelling something awful when she was filling her water bottle from a nearby stream. We all chuckled nervously and took tentative sips from our beers before Jessenia jokingly suggested that maybe we should check it out. As we mustered composure for a short investigation, we found something far more traumatizing than any prank or passive-aggressive animal warning, shreds of torn flesh near what looked like human remains. The horrified expressions on each other's faces confirmed that none of us were playing some sick joke. We weren't prepared for something like this. Fueled by panic and adrenaline, we ran back to our campground, grabbing our phones and stumbling over each other to contact the authorities. Our sense of security shattered, and we discussed in hushed whispers how a bear or some other predatory animal could have done this. That's when we saw it. A figure emerged from the surrounding darkness, towering over us with tufts of hair and broad shoulders like some monstrous aberration. All logic flew out the window as we realized what stood before us, Bigfoot. The thing gazed around the campsite snarling and casting a blood-chilling stare directly at me. As my mind raced for a solution, any semblance of logic lying in tatters, I directed my friends to scramble back into our tents while I attempted a diversion. With all the foolish bravery that comes with doing what one believes to be the right thing, I threw a heavy bundle of firewood at Bigfoot and succeeded only in piquing its anger. It charged me, claws raised and ready for another victim of its carnage. At that moment, the campground transformed into a chaotic scene of screaming and disarray as everyone tried to escape the monster's grasp. Narrowly avoiding death, I climbed a nearby tree and witnessed the terrifying treetop view of Bigfoot clawing through a tent, only to realize its prey had escaped. It howled with frustration and retreated back into the forest from whence it came, leaving us shaken but alive. Days later, after our harrowing ordeal, we learned from an old park ranger that there had been sightings of unknown creatures in those woods, whispers among the locals about abductions gone cold. We never would have believed it if not for our own despairing encounter with reality's darkest corners. Some nights... When I lay in bed bathed in darkness and stillness, memories of that fateful weekend overpower my thoughts. The image of those terrible claws descending towards my throat haunts my dreams, and I can't help but wonder if that monster still lurks in the unknown shadows, waiting for its next victim. Since that night, I've become a changed man. No longer am I the logical, numbers-driven accountant I once was. Instead, I've become obsessed with understanding and uncovering the mysteries that lie hidden in the darkest recesses of our world. My friends and I, now bonded together through an experience marked by terror and inexplicable circumstances, have dedicated our lives to researching cryptids and other mysterious phenomena. Traveling from one location to another, speaking to locals, and documenting every shred of evidence we find, we've become known as the Mahogany Investigators. While we've yet to encounter another being like the Bigfoot that nearly ended our lives, our journey has led us to unearth other unexplained occurrences and inexplicable creatures whispered only in legends. Despite being confronted with seemingly absurd claims and unintelligible conspiracies daily, we push on with resolve because we know firsthand that extraordinary things can be found in nature's shadows. Our adventure has taught us that sometimes fear can be a catalyst for transformation. Though the scars of our past still linger within us, they've also opened up a whole new reality where nothing is black and white, a world gripped by mystery and enveloped in shadows waiting to be explored.
I was doing an evening patrol through the park, flashlight in hand, taking in the familiar scent of damp earth from the first rain after a long day. It was around 8.35 p.m. on August 3rd, and I found myself off Goldfield Road in Apache Junction, Arizona. As an Oglala Sioux and Park Ranger for many years, it wasn't my first time on these trails. I'd likely covered every inch of them a hundred times or more. Martin, Marty, Choate, that's me, the guy everybody takes for granted, would be trekking these routes until his weary legs gave out. My father used to tell me wild stories of folklore from our heritage, legends that haunted my childhood. Only when I got older did I shake off those childish fears. Off in the distance, I spotted smoke hovering above a set of trees. Upon further inspection, a young couple huddled together around a makeshift campfire. In their panic at seeing my uniform and flashlight, they hastily snuffed out the fire with dirt and water. Thank God it's just you. The woman exhaled with relief. We heard strange noises coming from out there. She pointed beyond the camp's perimeter nervously, taking another drag of his cigarette before flicking it into the darkness. Her partner dismissed it as probably just coyotes, but I decided to investigate anyway. The park's closed at this time. I informed them. You need to pack up and leave before something really bad happens. I left them grumbling to themselves about overzealous park rangers while I headed in the direction they had pointed. As I trekked farther into the vast forested area, dense fog rolled in and enveloped me like a wet blanket. Underfoot were deep depressions in the soil, too large for any of the wildlife I was familiar with. A mixture of disquiet and curiosity nudged me onward. I stumbled upon an abandoned makeshift shack about half a mile from the couple's campsite. The scene bore evidence of a brutal struggle, with dried blood splattered around the place. All sorts of belongings were scattered on the floor, a trail of desperation, and in that moment, I felt the air turn ice cold. Help, please, a faint voice stammered. I shone my flashlight under a table only to find an old man with searing gashes across his limbs. His eyes were imprints of horror, and he was shaking uncontrollably. The words, Skinwalker, escaped his lips, hardly audible, before he passed out. My heart thundered as I remembered the Native American folklore creature described to me as a child, a shape-shifting witch who can transform into or possess various animals. I hauled the injured man over my shoulder and raced back to my vehicle, dialing 911 en route. Soon after paramedics arrived and loaded him onto a gurney, I caught Corey Delgado, a fellow ranger I knew since we attended elementary school together, eyeing me warily. I've been here for hours, he whispered. Something's not right about this place. Within minutes, we brought a police officer up to speed. He promised to look into it but warned that it was likely just some locals pulling pranks on tourists. Reluctantly, but unable to shrug off my unease, I agreed to return to the scene with Corey in tow. Later that week, the injured man succumbed to his wounds. We were informed by one of his family members that they had found odd twigs and bones laid out near his hospital window in unmistakable patterns on several occasions. Nobody could explain how they got there or what they symbolized. As Corey and I discussed theories over coffee, our confusion turned to dread when two park visitors were found mauled to death. The park was shut down, and we were instructed to hold down the fort. Even as seasoned rangers, we couldn't help but shudder as the dark silhouettes of trees warped and swayed in the wind. We never found out who or what was terrorizing the park, but the whispers of Skinwalker still haunt us. Life returned to normal once more, bearing a heavier weight than before, a cold reality intertwined with ancient lore. 
Perhaps there will always be mysteries lurking in these dense forests, secrets beyond our grasp, where memories of the darkness are etched forever in our souls. Months passed since those tragic incidents, but neither Corey nor I could shake off the lingering sense of unease. The park had reopened, and tourists flocked to the picturesque landscapes once more, seeking peace in nature's embrace. The authorities chalked up the attacks to unusually aggressive wildlife. It was easier for the public to digest than twisted Native American folklore come to life. We decided to attend a local shaman's gathering to gain insight into the terrifying events we had witnessed. In hushed voices, elders shared stories of evil spirits encroaching upon our land their whispers entwining with the warmth of the campfire flames and casting an eerie shadow across our faces. The shaman recommended performing cleansing rituals around the park, hoping to dispel any lingering malevolence lurking among trees and trails. With deeply furrowed brows, Corey and I embarked on this ritualistic journey, guided by age-old knowledge handed down through generations. We smudged sage and sweetgrass at specific locations, reciting sacred Oglala Sioux prayers under twilight spell. As we progressed through our tasks, an inexplicable calm descended upon us, challenging our inner turmoil. In time, we noticed a gradual change in the atmosphere surrounding Apache Junction. Wildlife returned in droves, seemingly unfazed by whatever darkness had plagued the area before. Park visitors shared tales of breathtaking beauty rather than spine-chilling encounters cloaked in fear. Though peace seemed restored for now, Corey and I knew deep within that there would always be mysteries hidden beneath nature's verdant cloak. Remaining ever vigilant against whatever nameless horrors might lurk in the night became our unspoken solemn pledge. For as long as misshrouded forests cast their tangled shadows on Apache Junction's trails, we would stand guard at its gates. Why had I agreed to join the camping trip in the first place? The thought nagged me as I sipped my beer, watching my friends laugh and joke around the campfire. It was supposed to be a fun weekend getaway in the backwoods of a popular place in the US. We were all supposed to forget our troubles and worries. Nobody could have guessed that it would all change within a matter of hours. My name is Simon Whitley a guy with an unremarkable past and an office job that was slowly sucking out my soul. I was surrounded by longtime friends from college. There was Mike, the joker of the group, Jennifer, smart and pretty but equally stubborn, and Lucas, an introverted programmer who did his best to keep up with the conversations. As night fell, we shared ghost stories, trying our best to spook each other out. But not one of us believed in such nonsense. Maybe if we had, we would have been more cautious. It all started when we heard crunching leaves nearby in the pitch black woods. Who's there? I called out nervously. Silence followed for a moment before a rough voice responded. Apologies for disturbing y'all. Just passing through. Slowly, from the darkness emerged a figure a man with wild hair and a worn-out jacket covering his well-built frame. His name was Harlan Proctor, and he claimed he lived just over the horizon. His clothes were ragged and patched together haphazardly. He blended in perfectly with his surroundings. I won't be staying long. I just need to rest these weary bones. Harlan mumbled and took a seat near us. The unsettling vibe intensified when we caught glimpses of Harlan's hands and arms covered in what appeared to be dried blood. Jennifer mustered up some courage and asked about his injuries. Harlan sighed and opened up about his struggles as a farmer, having been forced to put down his beloved sick dog earlier that night. Sympathy replaced our initial anxiety, 
and we welcomed him. As the hours flew by, Harlan's stories grew darker and more twisted. It started with him recounting the bizarre happenings of the neighboring families meeting gruesome ends, all of which were eerily unreported by any official sources. His tales sent shivers down our spines and made us question his motives and sanity. Our unease built gradually as we paid closer attention to Harlan's chilling details. Was he involved in these brutal and sadistic acts? Around the campfire, our skepticism began to fester into an underlying paranoia. We realized too late that we were in danger when one of us decided to use the nearby outhouse. Jennifer volunteered and started her short walk into the darkness. It must have been only a few minutes later when her piercing scream sliced through the night's silence. Mike, Lucas, and I sprang into action, bolting towards the source of the screen with trembling hands gripping whatever makeshift weapons we could find. Harlan followed closely behind us, a slight grin spreading across his devilish face. The adrenaline-fueled rescue attempt soon turned into a game of cat and mouse, with Harlan preying on each one of us, ensuring maximum pain before leaving us at death's doorstep. The forest had become alive with echoing howls of pain punctuated by Harlan's maniacal laughter. Through quick thinking and sheer luck, I managed to hit Harlan on his right temple with a heavy rock before he could inflict more damage. As he crumpled to the ground, unconscious, we took our chance to escape back to our campsite. We grabbed as many essentials as possible and rushed out of that damned forest without looking back. Weeks later, we'd find out from a local newspaper article that Harlan Proctor was well known by the neighboring communities around the woods. He belonged to a family of notorious hillbillies with a violent streak, terrorizing generations of people. That night wouldn't be Harlan's last night in the woods, but it was definitely our last interaction with him. The terrors we face still haunt us in our nightmares, reminding us of how perilously close we were to losing our lives. I can only hope that no one else has to experience the horrors we went through in those backwoods ever again. Despite the traumatic experience, life eventually returned to a semblance of normalcy for each of us. Our weekly gatherings now took place in the safety and comfort of our own homes, with the memories of the campfire replaced by the glow of our TV screens as we binge-watched our favorite shows. The friendship between Mike, Jennifer, Lucas, and me grew stronger as we supported each other in coping with the nightmares that lingered from that dreadful encounter. We often visited therapists and sought professional help to aid in our healing process. However, that fateful camping trip left us all with a newfound appreciation for life and an unbreakable bond among us, a silver lining that had emerged from the darkness. As the years blurred by, we vowed to never forget what we had survived, etching it into our memories as a lesson to always trust our instincts and be cautious of strangers, even when they appeared harmless. Each day forward, we lived more bravely and fully, cherishing each moment, knowing just how fragile life could be. You know how they say that the only constant in life is change? Well, I never expected my life to change the way it did. It all started when I took up the job of a park ranger in one of the most popular places in the USA. My name is Nahima Nasila Cohen, and here's my story. I spent most of my time patrolling the park, interacting with visitors, and ensuring their safety. As a Creek Native American, I felt a deep sense of connection to this land and a responsibility to protect it. With an ancestral bond to nature, I was proud and content with my profession. The calm days subside as life prepares for a storm-overcoming routine. 
It was around mid-afternoon when I was conversing with a group of hikers who asked me about some unusual animal tracks nearby. Curiosity piqued mine and theirs, and I mused over how animals have an uncanny ability to adapt and survive. They continued their hike as we bid adieu. The situation seemed innocuous at first. A few days passed, and I noticed more hikers were reporting similar tracks in different parts of the park. Sightings of mutilated animals increased. It was unnerving. Concern mounted among visitors about predatory dangers lurking in the serene woods. My buddy Luke and I decided to investigate further. We spread out from base camp at dusk, carefully tracking any odd noises or animal activity. It wasn't long until we stumbled across gruesomely mauled carcasses oddly drained of blood, unnatural work. Jesus Christ, Luke whispered, taking a step back from the remains. What do you think could have done this? I wondered aloud. Luke shook his head bewilderedly and said, No clue, but let's get back. This gives me chills. We couldn't deny our curiosity and overwhelming fear. We pushed on deeper into a frightful unknown exploration, searching for answers beyond our wildest imaginations. Encounters unwavering intensified, and we discovered markings resembling Native American folklore, the Asaiga, a creature corrupting hearts and consuming the souls of its victims. Our mission took a grim turn once the cries for help rang out through the night. Hurrying towards the source, we found a gravely injured backpacker bleeding heavily from harrowing wounds. While Luke applied first aid, I mentally questioned how fast such a creature could appear and vanish, leaving destruction in its wake. What the hell is this thing? muttered Luke as he tightly wrapped the backpacker's leg in a bandage. We were suddenly on edge as leaves rustled behind us and quick, fleeting shadows danced through our peripheral vision. An unnerving sensation gripped us. The Asaiga was near. I clenched my fists, preparing for the inevitable face-off with this sinister folklore creature lunging violently at Luke and me. We fought for our lives, returning exchanges of desperate blows against the relentless beast. Time slipped as seconds stretched to hours under a ghastly moonshine spectacle of survival. Miraculously, we endured as the creature retreated into darkness, unable to satiate its appetite entirely. Overwhelmed and with adrenaline fading, we barely managed to transport the battered backpacker to safety and provide the medical attention necessary for recovery. Days later, an elderly Native American elder approached me while patrolling alone. She intoned deeply about the horrors her people had experienced throughout history, attacks of a Sega haunting her ancestors' stories across generations. With this shocking revelation, my life has never been the same since that night. Stalking an ancient evil fueled by human transgressions plagued my thoughts endlessly. Now, Looking back at that day walking among hikers discussing adaptability in nature like a distant memory before this haunting tale became part of me, change remains consistent as fears materialize into bloody encounters against the nightmarish Asaiga. Haunted by the chilling tales shared by the Elder, I dedicated myself to uncovering the mysteries surrounding the Asaiga. Alongside Luke, we delved deep into our ancestral heritage and folklore, seeking clues that could help us understand and perhaps even halt the creature's malevolent attacks. Months passed as we conducted extensive research and interviewed members of other Native American tribes while still maintaining our duties as park rangers. It became clear that our efforts were not in vain people reported a decrease in mutilated animals and mysterious occurrences within the park. But we knew this respite would be temporary if we did not find a way to confront the Asaiga directly. In our pursuit for answers, we encountered a traditional shaman who spoke of a powerful yet dangerous ritual capable of trapping the creature, but only if performed correctly. 
With apprehension and determination, Luke and I gathered the essential components needed for the ritual, including sacred herbs, prayer pouches, and intricate symbols meticulously drawn on parchment. We ventured into the heart of the darkness once more, armed with ancient knowledge and an unwavering resolve to protect our people and land from this eternal foe. As we conducted the ritual under a full moon's dim light, our chants echoed through the ominous wilderness. Before long, an eerie silence settled around us. Then suddenly, an anguished howl pierced through the night, a cacophony signaling both triumph and despair. The powerful ritual had captured the elusive Asaiga. Its menacing aura was now confined within an ornate relic forged by skilled artisans of old. Its once pervasive presence vanished like a fading nightmare as we secured it with sacred bindings. Yet, our quest was far from over. We accepted a new responsibility in safeguarding this malevolent force from jeopardizing harmony among nature and humankind again. Our ranger duties expanded beyond patrolling trails to include preserving ancestral wisdom and upholding balance between worlds once torn apart. We had embraced the new path laid before us, committed to our duty as protectors of both our lands and our people from ever-changing adversities. Over time, we recognized that change could also lead to growth, inner strength, and boundless resilience. A truth eternally etched into the very core of our beings, serving as an unwavering testament to the indomitable human spirit. I still remember that day vividly. It was a cold November evening, and I was waiting on the platform of Central Station in New York City, returning home from a long day at the office. As I leaned against the pillar, absent-mindedly checking my phone, a strange sensation crept over me. I brushed it off as nothing more than exhaustion and tried to focus on the incoming train's announcement. The train arrived right on schedule. The doors opened as commuters hustled out onto the bustling platform. Pushing my way through the throng of people, I finally secured my usual seat by the window and settled in for the ride. Glancing out at the city lights slowly fading into the night sky, I reflected on my past as a detective, remembering all those years living in Nevada before moving to New York. My name is Tristan Larkspur, and I am now just an ordinary guy working a desk job at an insurance company. However, that wasn't always the case. In my former life as an investigator, I handled numerous high-profile cases with considerable success, until one nearly cost me my life and forced me to leave Nevada forever. Lost in these thoughts, I didn't notice until too late that something was amiss in our subway car. A subtle unease began creeping among passengers while they whispered nervously and exchanged uncomfortable glances. In moments like these, my former instincts kicked in, and I surveyed our surroundings more carefully. In the far corner of the car stood two teenagers with unnaturally cold features and dark eyes that seemed to bore straight into your soul. The male went by Maxim Volkov. His accomplice was Sarah Finchley, unusual names that seemed eerily out of place in today's society. At this point, we were only aware of their unnerving presence and nothing more until later that night, when they launched their first attack, mercilessly beating an unsuspecting passenger named Eddie Nash over a perceived slight. The subway filled with screams as the two antagonists struck with wild abandon, fueled by some unknown, sinister purpose. I tried to intervene, but they vanished like phantoms into the darkness, taking my sense of security with them. Over the next several weeks, the city fell under siege as these black-eyed kids committed more heinous crimes, murders, kidnappings, and assaults, increasing exponentially 
leaving law enforcement scrambling to connect the dots. Survivors reported chilling tales of these emotionless predators relentlessly stalking their prey. Being unable to ignore my instincts, I came out of retirement to join my former colleagues back on the force in hunting down Maxim and Sarah. I couldn't help but wonder what drove these once innocent children to become malevolent creatures capable of such atrocities. Was it a tragic past? Brainwashing? Or simply an insatiable thirst for blood? As our investigation progressed, we uncovered a crucial piece of evidence. A hidden online forum where members shared real-life accounts of encounters with black-eyed children. This led us to one final post from a user named Orpheus1919, cryptically warning about an imminent attack at Central Station during peak hour in two days' time. Following this lead, we mounted a discreet operation at Central Station on the evening in question. As we tensely awaited any signs of Maxim and Sarah's arrival, we steeled ourselves for their inevitable acts of terror. But nothing could have prepared us for their gruesome entrance, bursting through the crowd wielding machetes and grinning sinisterly as chaos erupted around them. In that moment, Everything slowed down as passengers scattered while my teammates and I closed in on Maxim and Sarah, desperate to end their reign of terror. Gunshots echoed throughout the station as we engaged our adversaries. By some twisted luck or divine intervention, Maxim was finally taken down while Sarah, wounding several officers on her path to escape, collapsing against a nearby wall, my mind raced. Filled with the screams of terrified commuters and the sounds of gunfire still ringing in my ears. It was finally over, or so it seemed. Weeks later, I learned from an informant who had infiltrated the mysterious forum that Orpheus 1919 was secretly Sarah Finchley all along, and Maxim's death was just part of her twisted plan. To this day, she remains at large both a phantom and a constant shadow hanging over the city. As for me, Tristan Larkspur will never stop searching for the one who turned two innocent lives into a living nightmare. Now back on the force and fueled by an unrelenting determination, I dedicate each day to uncovering the truth behind these dark-eyed monsters and ultimately bringing Sarah Finchley to justice. The experience transformed me as a person, I no longer see life through the lens of an ordinary desk job but as a never-ending struggle against pure evil. Every morning, upon waking up and setting foot in the heart of this scarred city, I remind myself that there are more secrets lurking in its shadows than we can ever comprehend, and my purpose is to continue unveiling them, no matter where they may lead or how deep the darkness runs. While New York City may never fully recover from Maxim and Sarah's reign of terror, heroes like Tristan Larkspur will tirelessly work to ensure their conduct remains a chilling memory, not an unchecked reality. Life's funny, you know? One moment you're just going about your mundane existence, and the next, everything's turned upside down. It's like my grandfather used to say, change is the only constant in life. I never quite understood what he meant until that fateful day on November 18th, just outside of Seattle, Washington. My name is Kieran Montrose, by the way. At the time, I was working as a bartender downtown. It was a typical night like any other when Carlton Rivers, a childhood friend of mine, suggested we go camping over the weekend at Snoqualmie Pass, a popular tourist spot near Mount Baker National Forest. He joked that it would be a nice break from reality. Little did we know how much truth lay in that statement. On Friday evening, after finishing our shifts, we hit the road. We nestled into our campsites late at night and shared stories around the fire. 
By Saturday morning, we were ready for some fishing. As we searched for a good fishing spot near the river, we stumbled across an overturned kayak and torn fishing gear along the river bank. What do you think happened? Carlton asked as he inspected a shredded life vest. No idea, I replied uneasily. But this doesn't feel quite right. He nodded in agreement but laughed it off soon after. We decided to fish nearby, where we found an expansive area full of scattered debris resembling a campsite, had it not been unsettlingly deserted. As time went on and fish evaded our hooks despite our best attempts to catch them, I noticed Carlton's increasing unease. Man, he said nervously, do you get the feeling something weird's been going on around these parts? Eh, I don't really believe in all that supernatural mumbo-jumbo. I responded half-heartedly, as I only then realized there was no sound nearby, not even birds or insects, creating an unsettling silence. A few hours later, our relaxing getaway had become increasingly tense and ominous. A feeling of dreadful anticipation gnawed deep within me. Just as I decided I couldn't take it anymore, Carlton suddenly whispered, Hey, did you hear that? Hear what? Those heavy footsteps, he said, fear evident on his face. It sounds like something big is approaching. I strained my ears and finally caught wind of the faint but relentless sound, an unknown anomaly in an otherwise deafening silence. We decided to pack up and hurry back to our campsite before dark. As we made our way through the woods in the waning daylight, the eerie footsteps never seemed to cease. At times, it felt as though they were closing in on us, but they remained elusive and unseen. Fear grew like a well-fed fire by the second, and by the time we reached our campsite, everything within me was screaming for us to leave. Ignoring my instincts cost us dearly as Carlton went off momentarily to gather some firewood. I could see his silhouette through a gap in the trees when I felt something hot dripping onto my shoulder. An apprehensive sensation crept up my spine as I looked up, fearing blood, but instead found myself face to face with unearthly yellow eyes belonging to an eight-foot-tall creature covered in filthy large tufts of fur with a rank odor that left me gagging. Before I could scream or run, it snatched me from the ground like a rag doll and rushed deeper into the forest. My vision blurred with panic and agony tearing through me until suddenly everything went black. After days of boundless torment at that beast's hands, or rather paws, thousands of thoughts flooded through my head, yet among them all, one prevailed above all else, survival. Through sheer willpower, or perhaps just stubbornness, I managed to plan my escape, fueled by adrenaline. The Bigfoot creature had left me momentarily unattended, and I seized the opportunity to break free, leaving it howling with rage in the distance. Bruised, battered, and bloodied, I stumbled my way back to camp, where Carlton was waiting. The relief on his face upon seeing me alive was just as intense as the dread before. At that moment, we knew we needed to leave immediately. After our escape, and I've omitted many of the more gruesome details. People didn't believe our story. That is, until one of them recalled the local urban legend of Bigfoot sightings throughout history, though no one had ever survived an attack from something drawn from pure nightmares. As word spread about our harrowing encounter, it ignited a frenzy of Bigfoot hunters and curious thrill-seekers descending upon the area eager to prove or disprove our tale. Media outlets clamored for interviews, and before we knew it, Carlton and I were thrust into an unwelcome spotlight. We became symbols of fear and hope. Some people convinced us we were telling the truth, while others accused us of fabricating our story for attention. However, as the months went by and nobody could produce any verifiable evidence of Bigfoot's existence, interest began to wane. 
life eventually returned to something resembling normalcy. But the memories of our nightmarish experience left indelible scars on both of our minds. Carlton and I couldn't continue living with those haunting images ingrained within us, so we joined forces with other survivors and witnesses to form a support group. That group became more than therapy. It was a lifeline. As we pooled our knowledge and experiences while attempting to face our fears together, we became not only friends but also determined sleuths. Our goal evolved from seeking solace to uncovering the truth behind these mysterious creatures. The journey that started on that fateful day at Snoqualmie Pass led us on a worldwide expedition covering the most famous cryptids like Yeti and Chupacabra. Along the way, we met a diverse range of people, some of whom had their own terrifying encounters, while others desperately wanted proof that there was more to this world than just what meets the eye. And though we never found irrefutable evidence of Bigfoot's existence, we had each gained something far more valuable through our shared adventures, an unbreakable bond forged in courage, resilience, and a relentless pursuit of truth. I was driving along the narrow, winding Route 11 after finishing my 12-hour shift as a Sioux native park ranger in South Dakota. My name is Kestiger Redfeather, and being a park ranger here has its moments, but I never could have anticipated what was about to unfold. It was already dark outside on that fateful night, and all I wanted was to get back home and rest. Though exhausted, Something about the dense forest on either side of the road felt strange, even menacing. I shook it off as just another normal night surrounded by nature. After all, growing up in this area, I'd heard countless stories of danger lurking in these woods. I studied criminal justice before becoming a ranger, following in my grandfather's footsteps. He would always tell me stories about his adventures as a fearless park ranger back in the day. But this night felt different, almost like there was something off about the air around me. The phone rang just as I started picking up speed. It was my colleague Skinan Isaacs, who joined me on some routine patrols before but who now also worked at our local sheriff's office. Hey Kestiju, Skinan started nervously. You remember that old abandoned campground near your station? The one that's kind of off limits? Yeah, what about it? I replied cautiously. Well, we got an anonymous tip that someone went missing out there today, hiking or something. But it's probably a prank, though. I knew the spot he was talking about. It had been closed down for years because it held spiritual significance for our tribe. Despite my growing uneasiness with how tonight's atmosphere already felt inexplicably weird, safe neighborhood practice meant we investigated anyway. Skinan met me at the entrance to the campground less than an hour later with his SUV full of police gear. Dude, what if we find something for real? He asked as we navigated our flashlights through the dark, decrepit trails. As we walked deeper into the woods, there was an eerie, thick silence surrounding us. We could no longer even hear the wind rustling through the trees. That's when I spotted a shocking sight, what looked like a bare carcass torn apart, with signs of a struggle. The blood trail led further into the campground. Ski not, I whispered. Keep your eyes open. This looks bad. Moments later, we found the missing hiker's body, his entire face had been ripped off. It wasn't just a wild animal attack. Whatever did this was ruthless and calculated. Skinan and I tried to piece together the horrifying puzzle of what we saw. It didn't resemble any claw marks from creatures in these woods. Working fast and trying not to panic, we called for backup and secured the scene until help arrived. 
The next few days were spent hunting down more leads on this mysterious predator. Footprints that appeared almost human. Testimonies of unnatural glowing eyes stalking people at night. Then my grandfather mentioned a local legend about a creature named Wendigo, a malevolent spirit known to possess unsuspecting souls and turn them into monsters who craved human flesh. Yet he never suspected it to be real. The case made national news because of its grisly nature, a Native American ranger facing off against an ancient evil that haunted his lands. Wendigo, who'd only been considered folklore, was now at the center of this small rural community's nightmare. I never thought something like this would happen to me on my watch as a park ranger, but it turned out to be much more than just some fable passed down through generations. Wendigo, the terror from ancient stories, was now my grim reality. Determined to get to the bottom of this dreadful mystery, I joined forces with Skinan and a team of experts, including a biologist and a historian familiar with our tribe's mythology. We spent weeks studying the grisly crime scene, analyzing evidence, and digging through ancient texts for any hint of how to confront the Wendigo. Our journey led us deep into Sioux history, unearthing tales of shamans who attempted to battle this demonic entity centuries ago using sacred rituals and talismans. It soon became clear that we were dealing with something far beyond the scope of traditional law enforcement. As we continued our investigation, reports of more gruesome attacks piled up, sending shockwaves throughout the community. Parents were too scared to let their children play outside. Businesses closed early, and police implemented nightly patrols to ensure the safety of frightened residents. Our once peaceful town was now living in terror, a feeling that we knew all too well. In an effort to restore order and protect our land, we decided to employ old tribal wisdom. After consulting with tribal elders and spiritual leaders, I embarked on a vision quest a rite of passage in Native American culture, to seek guidance from my ancestors. Over several days in isolation, without food or water, I meditated and prayed for clarity on how to defeat the Wendigo. On the final night of my vision quest, I received a powerful vision. An ancient warrior appeared before me holding a spear adorned with symbols that seemed to pulsate with energy. Without words but with a fierce confidence in his eyes, he handed me the spear, our tribe's sacred weapon against evil spirits, and then vanished. Now armed with the knowledge and spiritual power bestowed upon me by my ancestors, I gathered my team, along with Skinan and local law enforcement officers, for one last pursuit into the darkness that had engulfed our community. We would hunt this ancient evil plaguing our home and stand together to confront the unimaginable nightmare of the Wendigo, whatever the cost. What are the odds of something truly horrifying happening to a person twice in their life? I asked myself that question so many times before, wondering if, merely by pondering it, I was inviting disaster. It's not a fun thought, but it all changed that fateful day. My name is Grayson O'Rourke, and I'm an avid camper and outdoorsman. I've spent most of my life hiking and camping in the backwoods of the United States. My friends and I occasionally take extended trips to remote uninhabited places, always eager to escape from the pressures of daily life. But what happened on this most recent trip still baffles me. It was Jonah who came up with the idea to tackle a new location, tucked far from civilization. You see, Jonah Stryker was my best friend since we were kids. He knew how difficult my personal life had become after Melinda left me two months prior. The allure of adventure and solitude seemed like a perfect remedy for my emotional turmoil. 
We set up camp just as dusk fell on our first night in the wilderness. As we roasted hot dogs over the fire, we talked about past trips and shared campfire stories. While we laughed and reminisced, a sinister shadow lurked just beyond our sight. The next day, with heavy backpacks filled with supplies, we began our journey deeper into the woods. However, despite our energetic start, I couldn't help but feel an overwhelming sense of strangeness that fogged my mind as we trekked onward. It was during these first few hours that we stumbled upon an abandoned trailer, if you could call it that anymore. Half destroyed by time and nature, it wasn't much more than scrap metal strewn across a small clearing. Among the debris were rusty gas cans and empty bottles of alcohol, residues of a life long gone. Jonah grew quiet as soon as he saw the stained and tattered mattress lying on the ground a few feet away from the collapsed trailer. He was about to dismiss the eerie scene when he noticed something that made his blood run cold, a distinct dent in the rusted pipe lying near the mattress. With growing unease, we decided to set up camp further away from the wreckage. Although it took some effort to clear my thoughts over dinner that night, our choice to continue without discussing this terrifying discovery felt right. However, sleep eluded me as my mind conjured up images from our findings earlier that day. I couldn't shake the feeling that someone might be watching us. The following day, we chose to change our course and head back toward a familiar trail. We were in the process of packing up when Mitch Douglas, an elderly and experienced hiker who occasionally joined us on our outdoor excursions, appeared, seemingly out of nowhere. As we shared our chilling discovery with Mitch, his expression darkened. He was well acquainted with local lore. He told us about a vengeful hillbilly named Rufus who used to live in these woods many years ago. His sinister reputation was notorious throughout local communities. The family's fondness for moonshine had led their violent patriarch Rufus on a rampage one night, leaving his wife, daughters, and innocent people from a nearby settlement dead. Following this bloodbath, local authorities launched a manhunt for Rufus but never found him or any traces of his existence. As Mitch recounted the grisly tale of Rufus and his sinister deeds, I felt a chill burrowing into my bones. The details matched almost perfectly with those chilling vestiges we had stumbled upon earlier. Was it possible that Rufus still roamed these woods? And if so, what danger did we face by venturing deeper into his territory? Unfortunately, we never got to answer those questions or contemplate our options because later that day, as we navigated the dense foliage, dread washed over us as we spotted bloody ropes dangling from nearby trees, gutted rabbits and squirrels hanging like macabre ornaments. It reminded me of the old folk wisdom. The deeper you go, the darker it gets. As we stared in horror at the gruesome spectacle, we knew that we needed to get out of there as quickly as possible. Panic began to set in, and we scrambled to retrace our steps desperate to put some distance between us and the scene we had just stumbled upon. Our hearts pounded in our ears as we navigated the thorny underbrush, praying we wouldn't come face to face with the ruthless woodsman who had undoubtedly created this nightmarish landscape. Our friendship and familiarity with one another provided some comfort, but there was no mistaking the terror in each other's eyes. As the hours passed, it felt as though the forest was closing in around us, swallowing up any hope of escape. Just when it seemed like all hope was lost, we finally broke through a thicket of trees and emerged into a small clearing where a narrow dirt path wound through the woods. It was a familiar sight that led back to our initial campsite and ultimately safety. Exhausted and traumatized, we followed the path while keeping an eye out for any signs of danger. As we trudged onward through our treacherous escape route, 
We couldn't help but question what events had unfolded during those malicious years beneath Rufus' reign. We vowed to never return to these accursed woods and would forever be haunted by what might have happened had we continued further into Rufus' domain. For now, at least, the darkness that consumed these woods could no longer touch us, but it would forever cast a shadow over our once beloved wilderness adventures. There's an old saying that goes something like, The devil is in the details. I never really understood what it meant until a late summer night back in 2012. You see, life as a Creek Native American park ranger got pretty interesting for me when I took a post at one of the most popular parks in the States. My name is Nahima Ahanu. Before you ask, it means mysterious steward. Quite fitting, don't you think? Anyway, my parents settled in a small town nearby after leaving the reservation. Growing up both in and around nature, I developed a deep-rooted love for every creepy critter, bush, and tree there was, and still do. It all began at my favorite lookout spot on Eagle's Peak. You could say it was just another ordinary day until Trenton Ackerman showed up bloodied and battered struggling to catch his breath. I knew Trent from our poker nights at Wyatt's Bar down the road. He wasn't an outdoors a person by any means. Help me, Nahimana, please! He wheezed. I couldn't believe my eyes. Trenton was usually a relentless jokester who barely ever looked serious. As I tended to his wounds, Trent proceeded to tell me about his ordeal. Out of nowhere, while he was taking his first sober solo hike through the park, proof that he lost the bet again, something snatched one of his best friends right before his eyes. He said it looked like a twisted amalgamation of humans and some hellish creature straight out of American native folklore, with sinewy muscles rippling under scaly skin as it shattered bones effortlessly with unnatural strength. The stark contrast between brutal ferocity and eerie grace haunted Trent as his own survival instincts kicked into overdrive. A vivid description surely yet as good as his storytelling was, skepticism reigned supreme within my mind. But one couldn't ignore the fact that his remaining friends had not yet returned from the very same hike. So I set out to investigate, grabbing my trusty radio flashlight, and pocket knife for when SH asterisk T hit the fan. As I tiptoed along the trail Trent indicated, the encroaching twilight sent shivers down my spine. The otherwise vibrant park started morphing into an ominous sketch of itself as shadows spilled into every crevice. I felt the cold grasp of unseen eyes. Their scrutiny mocked my futile comfort in keeping taboo secrets at bay. A sudden rush of movement sent dried leaves whirling behind a bush up ahead. Hearing muffled voices arguing from a nearby cave entrance, logical thinking took center stage. Could these be trespassers needing intervention? Or worse? Advancing cautiously towards them, unexpected events unfolded. Their frantic breaths confessed fear, but my back against the wall training kicked in. Three strangers emerged, two survivors minus one arm and a leg each, plus a loner claiming to study urban legends in his free time. The amateur investigator handed me an old picture and shared his own findings since arriving. The more he spoke, the more everything started lining up, from Trent's terrified mannerisms to the gory mess left behind on the trail. Turns out this monster was Nalissa Falea or long black being, in the native tongue, a malevolent spirit that feeds on those who venture too close to nature's heart. Locals thought it was just another campfire tale until families near wooded areas began disappearing at night. That creepy grin after clamping down seemed scarily real now. 
It fed on the helplessness of the hopeless like me. We reported back to Trent that Nigel and Emily, his other friends, were goners. Our cover-up insistence didn't hold much water. He realized it wasn't some mere animal attack. The park soon gained an unsettling infamy with whispers of Melissa Falea's existence. Unpalatable for tourists, the area was closed indefinitely under safety concerns. I never saw Trenton at poker nights afterward, and deep down, I couldn't blame him. And so, the devil's existence is in the details we choose to ignore, until one day, it stares you right in the face, grinning unabashedly as it consumes everything you know and love. In the years following the closure of the park, I found myself engrossed in learning more about Melissa Falea and other Native American legends, hoping to better protect my people and my land. I delved into old books and sought guidance from tribal elders, piecing together a vast web of mythology that spanned generations. My newfound knowledge opened doors to a world I was only beginning to understand, where nature was a living entity that held secrets beyond our imaginations. However, the feeling of overwhelming guilt for not being able to prevent those tragic incidents constantly gnawed at me. This guilt served as a driving force behind my relentless pursuit for answers, hoping to find some semblance of closure for the people affected by this tragedy. I realized that I was not alone in this quest. There were others who had encountered similar encounters with the supernatural. We formed an alliance sharing experiences and pooling resources to better understand the ancient forces at work in our communities. Slowly but surely, we began to uncover methods that could weaken these malevolent spirits, as well as warning signs that could prevent future defiance against nature's rules. Despite our best efforts, Trenton remained forever scarred by the horrors he'd witnessed. He became a recluse, haunted by nightmares that rendered sleep impossible. But his traumatic experience served as a sober warning for others who dared venture too deep into nature's embrace, respect or suffer ruin. As I continued forging new paths in my life guided by these hidden truths, my perspective shifted drastically. No longer did I view nature solely as a source of beauty and solace but rather as a powerful force demanding reverence. Indeed, every tree, creature, and whispering wind now served as a reminder that beneath their enchanting facade lay ancient entities with the simultaneous capacity for unspeakable destruction and magnificent wonder. For they are the truest manifestations of an eternal adage, Within even the most pristine, enchanting aspects of our world, the devil and other sinister forces hide silently in the details, waiting to pounce when least expected. I still remember that evening like it was yesterday. I was meeting up with my buddies at our favorite bar, the Rustic Raven, after a long day at work. It was just off the freeway in a popular area not too far from downtown. We always liked the laid-back atmosphere and the friendly bartenders, who would often pour us a shot on the house. My name is Lachlan Romero, and I'm a forensic analyst. My job is to collect and examine evidence found at crime scenes, which usually involves working closely with the police department. I've always been drawn to true crime stories and had become quite desensitized to violence. Or at least I thought so until that night. As we sipped our beers and traded jokes, I had no idea that our lives were about to change forever. It started with a commotion outside. An argument that escalated quickly as two guys tussled on the ground near the entrance of the bar. We watched warily while trying to mind our own business, but soon found ourselves dragged into something much darker than we could have imagined. 
the fight seemed to subside as one man appeared to gain control over the other, holding him down with surprising efficiency for someone his size. However, that's when we noticed something strange about him. His appearance wasn't what took us by surprise. Rather, it was his eyes. Two black voids staring into your soul like some malevolent creature from ancient myth. His name became clear later when we heard about similar incidents in town. They called him Ezra Blackwood. At this exact moment, though, all we knew was that those eyes struck genuine fear into our hearts. As bystanders attempted to intervene, Ezra snarled violently, releasing his captive only to leap on one of his would-be rescuers. The scene became chaotic. Blood flowed as teeth met flesh while people screamed and tried to flee. It was as if Ezra had lost all humanity, as if he sensed our fear and desperation, feeding off our panic like a beast from the darkest recesses of hell. The police arrived shortly after, but by that time, Ezra was gone. He had left a bloody trail that led to multiple injured victims on the pavement. The images still haunt me to this day, crying and grasping their wounds, dazed by the sudden brutality they just witnessed. It wasn't until after several statements and interviews that we came to learn who or what had assaulted those people outside the rustic raven. Apparently, Ezra Blackwood belonged to a mysterious group of individuals known as the Black-Eyed Kids. Their actions seemed almost paranormal in nature, feeding on inexplicable dread and causing havoc wherever they went. During one of my shifts at the police station a week later, I overheard some officers discussing the case. They mentioned that a religious cult leader named Barnabas Crow had been orchestrating the black-eyed kids and using them to commit these violent acts across town. Talk about sinister motives. We never saw Ezra again after that night at the Rustic Raven, but his memory lingers in our nightmares. Despite working in the field of forensics and true crime, nothing could have prepared me for the stark reality of an encounter with pure evil. Some mysteries are better left unsolved, and some names are better left unspoken. For our own peace of mind, we try our best to forget about Ezra Blackwood and the Black-Eyed Kids. Months went by, and our once favorite bar, the Rustic Raven, began to lose its charm. The shadows of that night lingered, casting a dark veil over the lively banter that used to fill the air. Curiosity eventually got the better of me, and I couldn't resist diving into whatever information I could find about the black-eyed kids and their ominous leader, Barnabas Crow. Delving into scattered reports and obscure online forums led me further down the rabbit hole of macabre tales and hushed whispers about their cult-like rituals. Soon enough, my fixation on unraveling the truth behind this phenomenon began affecting my work. I found myself poring over any case file that even remotely resembled Ezra Blackwood's M.O. My fixation didn't go unnoticed by my colleagues, who tried to convince me that it was time to let it go. One day, a mysterious package arrived at my door, unmarked and devoid of any indication of its origin. Inside lay a weathered book filled with ancient symbols and illustrations of rituals that sent shivers down my spine. My heart raced as I thumbed through the pages before landing on an ink-stained page outlining an incantation designed to banish these malevolent beings back to their hellish realm. Armed with this knowledge, I confided in my close friends about my discovery. Our shared trauma had created an inseparable bond between us. And after much debate, we decided it was worth attempting the ritual in an effort to rid our city of this nightmarish menace for good. Carefully following the instructions laid out in the cryptic tome, we ventured into a deserted clearing in a nearby forest under the new moon, the very place where Barnabas Crow was rumored to dwell. As we began the incantation, our surroundings seemed to darken even further as an eerie mist crept through the trees. Just as we were about to complete the final verse, 
that bone-chilling gaze of Ezra Blackwood and the black-eyed kids emerged from the shadows, bearing down on us with a rage-filled intensity that threatened to consume us whole. There's something to be said about the nature of fear and how it creeps in and takes hold of you in the most unexpected moments. It was around 6.15 p.m. on a Tuesday when I was contemplating this very thought at Finnegan's, a popular pub in the heart of Boston. I rubbed at the scruffy beard on my face, quite unsure of how I ended up in this overcrowded bar after a long day at work. As an investigative journalist by trade, I still cringe when introducing myself as such. My days were often filled with curiosity and chaos, which sometimes bled into my personal life. My name is Theo Vanagon, not your everyday run-of-the-mill Joe Schmo name most people tend to have. And even though I had been known to chase after stories involving crime lords and corrupt politicians, it was there, at Finnegan's where it all began that fateful day. As I sipped on my stout, loud laughter erupted from a group of friends behind me. Their drunken banter reminded me that people do manage to find joy in their lives. My train of thought was interrupted by Maggie, the bartender with striking red hair who had a knack for cracking sarcastic jokes. Hey, Theo! Be careful not to drown your thoughts there. She quipped with a chuckle. It was no secret that Maggie excelled at poking fun at people she liked. You got me there. I smiled back before regaling her with one of my less harrowing workplace anecdotes. Just as our conversation picked up steam, a man wearing a muddy overcoat and torn jeans burst through the door. He had a look of pure terror on his face and his ragged breathing echoed through the once noisy pub gone quiet. Taking stock of the situation immediately as an oddly responsible habit gained through my line of work, I put some cash on the counter for Maggie and briskly walked towards the shaken man. He grabbed my arm, uttering something about maws and claws, inhumanly strong. I could tell that every word he let out was fueled by panic, his aged face wore years of work and toil, making me sure he wasn't the type to be thrown off by a couple of cheap jump scares. Whatever it was that had happened, it was serious. Seeing the sincerity embedded within the crevices in his expression, I glanced over at Maggie, who seemed to have gone straight into action mode by dialing 911, a number she was now an expert at thanks to multiple bar fights. The stranger, introduced later as Clem Jenkins, an odd name combination for sure, gulped down water ferociously while I draped a warm blanket around his shoulders as he shared what had transpired. Without drawing any harmful conclusions, he claimed to have found something akin to Bigfoot, better known as the Sasquatch or Skunk Ape. As gripping as his story may be, I couldn't help but struggle with doubt. Yet his account of partially devoured livestock and superhuman strength causing him to flee didn't quite add up to him having conjured this terror from thin air either. During the days that followed, pieces of Clem's story started intertwining with parallel happenings around Boston, lone travelers disappearing on nature trails just outside of town, medium-sized wildlife vanishing without a trace and torn up terrain in areas that people rarely explored. I was about to begin my investigation when word reached me that one of my oldest friends had gone missing on the Cranston Hill Trail, a place where we'd spent countless hours hiking together. Each new twist in this story added fuel to my journalistic instincts. The sole focus became unveiling the truth behind these incidents connected by threads too intricate for them all not to have originated from a single monstrous entity. In the weeks that followed, I'd battled against hellish monstrosities, 
some natural born and others of my own making, as I sought answers. Puzzles of information collapsed together like an intricate diamond arrangement, the numerous bits of clues and details reflecting a greater truth I could barely differentiate from fiction. In the end, the realization left me hollow, as empty sentiment forced me to face a landscape forever changed and painted by dread. It was only through poring over articles and interviews that I realized how intertwined this story had become, all the while leaving a legacy of bloodshed in its wake. Was it worth it to uncover the truth? I couldn't find solace in the answer, for every revelation had its cost. I'd become a haunted figure, tormented by visions of gargantuan creatures lurking in the shadows, waiting for their next unsuspecting victim. And though Clem's story was pieced together and set forth in my writings for the world to see, I harbored deep within the knowledge that some questions are better left unanswered. My life would never be the same after embarking on this twisted quest forever scarred by the insidious grip of fear that held Boston in its monstrous claws. In moments of quiet contemplation at Finnegan's, the very place where my journey began, I couldn't help but wonder if chasing after the unknown was worth losing a part of myself. But as an investigative journalist, it was ingrained in me, the unrelenting pursuit of truth, and despite all the horrors faced, Perhaps that was what made me who I am, Theo Vanagon, explorer of uncharted territories and an unwavering chronicler of humanity's darkest fears. It was a Saturday evening, around 6 p.m., on August 5th, deep in the heart of the Badlands National Park. I remember that day clearly because every fiber of my being was screaming that something was off. But I brushed it off. I couldn't let these feelings get in the way of a beautiful day on the job, right? My name is Akachita Chaitan, and I'm a Sioux native park ranger. My buddies and I were just finishing our routine patrol when we came across an abandoned campsite near a towering rock formation called the Pinnacles. We thought it might have been hikers who had strayed too far from their designated campsite, or maybe some kids looking for a thrill. Regardless, it was our job to clean up after them and figure out who they were. But as we surveyed the area, we found peculiar items scattered around shredded clothes, unidentifiable metal pieces, and worst of all, a trail of dark red drops leading off into the surrounding wilderness. We followed the trail cautiously, my colleagues Charlie and Javier cracking jokes while I tried to focus on the task at hand. We entertained passing thoughts about psycho murderers or escaped convicts, until we stumbled upon something that chilled us all to our core. Lying in a small clearing was the mangled body of Marcus Hillcrest, son of Diane Hillcrest, who owned the diner down in Rapid City. The look on his face. God, I can't even begin to describe it. He had been brutalized in ways that seemed almost incomprehensibly violent. My mind reeled with possible explanations but kept returning to one particularly gruesome Sioux legend rumored to have stalked these very lands for centuries. Charlie and Javier were visibly distressed but tried not to show it. Charlie went straight to his flask while Javier started mumbling prayers under his breath. Whatever killed this man made no earthly sense. The flesh was unmistakably ripped apart by sharp claws but the bite marks, by the spirits, they were several inches wider than any man's jaw. During our search for clues, we discovered pieces of torn clothing and a broken GoPro camera belonging to a man named Darren Martinez. We later interviewed his wife, who told us that Darren was a filmmaker who'd been exploring the area for an upcoming documentary. After a few days of investigating the park and the surrounding indigenous communities for more information on the crazed thing that attacked these people, 
we stumbled across some cryptic writings in an ancient Sioux dialect. After bringing in an expert linguist, Haniatema, to help us translate them, we learned about the Iktomi, a trickster and shapeshifter known for feeding on human essence or entrapping hapless souls for its own amusement. Now it all started to come together. There was no serial killer. No convict is on the run. The folktales we once dismissed with skeptical eyes have now become terrifyingly real. As we continued our investigation and interviewed local residents, who'd experienced unfathomable horrors at the hands of this creature, one life-changing encounter with the Iktomi confirmed our suspicions. This was no myth. It happened while we were returning from our latest search mission. My adrenaline was pumping through my veins as I approached a shallow creek illuminated by moonlight. There it stood, nearly ten feet tall, with dense skeletal shadows cast upon its twisted body and black eyes that seemed to simultaneously look straight into your soul while hiding its own intentions behind them. Its laughter licked my ears like poisonous breath as it disappeared into the night once more. Sometimes I can't help but wonder if it lured us there by blowing apart Darren's camera or leaving behind Marcus' mutilated corpse for us to find, or whether it played this game purely for sport as it had whispered secrets into Darren's ear while he was still alive. Now, the Tomi has become everything I fear and everything I chase. Native folklore, once thought to be long forgotten, is now a visceral reality. And the truth? The truth lies hidden within the shadows of this wilderness, waiting to be discovered by the next unwitting soul brave enough to venture out after dark. As the months went by, Charlie, Javier, Hania, and I found ourselves forming an unlikely alliance, determined to reveal the truth about the Iktomi and protect those who unknowingly ventured onto its hunting grounds. We spent countless hours studying ancient texts, interviewing elders from neighboring tribes, and piecing together a plan to combat this elusive and deadly creature. There were times when fear and uncertainty threatened to undermine our resolve, but we pressed on, driven by our common goal of ensuring that no other unsuspecting soul would suffer the same fate as Marcus and Darren. Our investigation took us to the darkest corners of the Badlands National Park, where we discovered chilling evidence of the Iktomi's presence and other gruesome incidents from decades past. These discoveries only served to bolster our determination and lend an aura of legitimacy to our quest, despite the skepticism we faced from others who dismissed us as mere storytellers or conspiracy theorists. As we continued our harrowing journey into the world of the Iktomi, each new encounter with its malevolent trickery left us feeling both horrified and exhilarated, knowing that with every step closer to understanding this enigma, we might also be entering into a dangerous game where we were nothing more than pieces on its twisted board. But as the stakes grew higher and our lives became increasingly entwined with this impending darkness, one thing became clear, against all odds, it was up to us to shine a light on the Iktomi's sinister secrets before it was too late. Why was I out here in these godforsaken woods in the first place? It's a question I've asked myself a thousand times since that night. My name is Langston Everett, a 26-year-old city dweller from Brooklyn, New York. I took the trip with two college friends, Deandra Abrams and Chris Drayton. We decided to embark on this adventure after discussions about needing a reset from our tiring lives. Little did we know that this decision would change our lives forever. In those woods, we found ourselves deep within a popular backwoods area in the USA. Many had deemed it picturesque and perfect for an escape from city life. We were skeptical but went along with the plan anyway. On our second day there, we were sitting around the campfire, 
cracking open our beers while reminiscing about old times. We couldn't help but be captivated by the beauty of our surroundings, untouched by human development, surrounded by nature's grandeur. The calm was suddenly disrupted when a series of loud bangs echoed through the trees. My heart began to race. None of us could determine what exactly made those sounds. Maybe some other guys are hunting out here, suggested Chris, attempting to put us all at ease. As my friends brushed it off, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. The darkness, silence, and isolation became too much for me, so I excused myself to take a leak. As I stood alone in the woods, watering a tree, an unsettling vibe washed over me. That's when I saw him, a tall, rugged man with unkempt hair and a beard, standing just beyond the reach of our campfire's light. Who are you? I asked hesitantly. No response from the shadowy figure, just cold blue eyes locked onto mine. The tension thickened as he disappeared into the night. When events took a violent turn, it started with the disappearance of Chris, who had gone to collect firewood. Panic set in as we searched desperately for him in the darkness. Unfortunately, we found his brutally mangled body in a shallow ditch. He was unrecognizable, a gruesome scene that seemed more like a mass of flesh, blood, and bone than human. The cold realization struck then. That imposing figure I'd locked eyes with earlier was the perpetrator. Even though we never saw his face clearly, I could still feel those chilling blue eyes burning into my memory. Overcome with fear and disbelief, Deandra and I stumbled upon an old farmhouse while trying to find our way back to civilization, a hiding place that introduced us to a new terror. The house's interior was beyond unsettling, blood-stained walls, animal carcasses, and weaponry scattered everywhere, like the long-abandoned lair of some deranged man-man. As we explored cautiously, a dreadful understanding washed over us. The man we encountered earlier that night wasn't acting alone. Whoever lived here had been hunting people for years, using these woods as their own personal playground. Our sanctuary became our prison cell when a rusty old pickup truck careened down the driveway. To our horror, the same fearsome man emerged from the vehicle and entered the house. It was clear that he had brought reinforcements with him. We could hear their guttural laughter echoing throughout the house. We somehow managed to evade our captors all night long, using every bit of cunning and tenacity we could summon. But it wasn't until daylight finally broke through that Deandra found her chance to call the police on her dying cell phone signal, an incident she recounted to me days after she escaped. When local authorities eventually raided the bloodied house, those who had held us captive had vanished. Two weeks later, a news report revealed that authorities were seeking information about the brothers Bane a pair of twisted hillbilly siblings named Terence and Jedediah Bain who'd been terrorizing the area for years. Although I'd barely survived that harrowing experience, there's one thing I can't shake. I still see those cold blue eyes staring back at me every time the darkness creeps in. And I know somewhere out there, waiting in those shadows, that menacing figure still lurks watching and waiting for his next victim to enter his murderous lair. It's been years since that night, but the memories continue to haunt me. I've tried therapy, medication, and every form of escapism available. Still, my past follows me like a shadow, a lingering reminder of the evil that lurks within the depths of humanity. Deandra and I became closer after we escaped, both of us confined by this shared trauma. We became each other's support system, two damaged pieces that managed to cling together in the darkness. Together, we pursued justice for Chris and all the others who had fallen victim to the brother's bane. Our lives have changed dramatically, from carefree city dwellers to fighters for justice, 
forever bound by those horrifying woods. In our pursuit, we discovered other survivors, people who had narrowly escaped the clutches of the Brothers Bane but were too afraid to come forward. Strength in numbers, bonds forged from mutual suffering. With time, we formed an organization built on shining a light into the darkest corners of human depravity. We understand that what we faced was not an isolated evil but a symptom of something much larger, a world filled with monsters that need to be stopped. Terence and Jedediah Bane remain at large despite our efforts. While they're still out there, we know in our hearts that time will eventually catch up to them, and when it does, I'll be waiting. And so will Deandra, along with all those who survived their wickedness. For as long as evil exists in this world, we will stand against it, avenging spirits return from hell to ensure no one else falls prey to those chilling blue eyes hiding in the darkness. Life has always been a delicate balance, especially out here in nature. As a Creek Native American and park ranger, you'd think I'd have everything figured out. But there was that one event that changed everything for me and many others in this popular place in the USA. My name is Talaka Whitehawk, and this story began on a seemingly ordinary day. It was around 4.30 p.m. when I met up with my buddy Mike another ranger in the area. We were just wrapping up about some missing equipment when I saw something out of the corner of my eye. Just a quick movement, enough to make me glance over, but nothing too concerning. I thought about it for a second, shrugged it off, and continued talking to Mike. That subtle, eerie feeling started to build as the hours went by. It grew stronger during our nightly patrol while we were keeping an eye out for poachers and campers who had stayed too late. That's when we noticed something odd. The animal sounds had gone quiet. Too quiet. It was as if they could sense something we couldn't. Hey Mike, I said casually. You noticed how quiet it's gotten tonight? Yeah, he replied, with a hint of concern in his voice. It's giving me the creeps, if I'm going to be honest. We decided to investigate further, and slowly made our way deeper into the woods. That's when we found it, a deer carcass torn apart with unusual precision. It wasn't an ordinary predator kill, we could tell from years of experience. Suddenly, something leaped out from behind us, a dark creature faster than anything we'd ever seen before. We instinctively grabbed our guns, but this creature dodged every shot with ease. The intensity escalated as we realized this thing was toying with us, stalking us like prey. The panic set in. Mike even tried throwing his walkie-talkie as the creature was too close, but it didn't work. As quickly as it started, the attack stopped, and the creature disappeared back into the shadows. Heart pounding and thoroughly spooked, Mike and I quickly headed for safety. We reported what had happened to our superiors, who reacted with skepticism and doubt. Weeks passed without any indication of that terrifying creature. However, strange incidents continued at an increasing frequency. Campers went missing, and more mutilated animals were found throughout the park. Finally, one day after a particularly gruesome discovery, we overheard some locals talking about a possible link to an American native folklore creature called Wendigo, a fearsome being known for its cunning and swift nature. They told us that they used to hear old stories of this evil creature preying on unsuspecting campers. Despite our initial skepticism about old tales, Mike and I felt compelled to get to the bottom of this mystery. We meticulously pieced together information from various sources and combed through decades-old reports of similar incidents in nearby regions. Ultimately, we concluded that whatever this thing was, 
maybe even a Wendigo, we could no longer question its existence or intentions. As rangers sworn to protect those in our park, we knew we had to do everything in our power to maintain balance in nature and prevent any more lives from being lost. And so our struggle against this elusive antagonist continues, brutal encounters from time to time, heart-pounding pursuits under moonlight, unexplainable events that continue to baffle us. But we face these challenges relentlessly because, one way or another, we're determined to restore order within these treacherous lands once again. Mike and I began developing a strategic plan to monitor and capture this elusive creature. We coordinated with other park rangers, local law enforcement, and even some of the Creek tribe elders, who shared valuable insight on ancient lore and traditional hunting techniques. Our initial attempts to track its movements proved difficult, as the creature left almost no trace behind. However, over time, we started noticing patterns, certain areas of the park that appeared to be favored hunting grounds, coupled with periods of heightened activity. We decided to set up multiple surveillance cameras in selected areas, hoping to gain crucial information on how it moved, hunted, and possibly even where it resided. The first few camera installations yielded little success. Frightening encounters continued to occur, but the creature seemed to elude our every effort. It was during one of those moments of despair that we had a breakthrough. A new camera position near a deer trail managed to capture a brief glimpse of the creature, an eerie figure barely visible in the footage before vanishing into thin air. This small victory felt like a turning point, now that we had tangible evidence. Both our determination and credibility amongst our colleagues increased substantially. With renewed hope, Mike and I intensified our efforts. We sought out experts in fields such as cryptozoology, folklore studies, and even wildlife behaviorists to further understand what we were dealing with and how best to approach it. As the situation unfolded, it became clear that capturing this creature would require far more than traditional tracking methods. We would need innovation and an understanding of how it eluded capture so skillfully. As an ongoing battle ensues against this dark force preying on the unsuspecting in our park, we stand resolute in our purpose, to restore balance within nature's delicate ecosystem and put an end to its reign of terror. Legends may have warned us about Wendigos and other menacing beings, a way for our ancestors to ensure caution in an unpredictable world, but we are determined to use our human ingenuity to write a new chapter, where we protect our loved ones and preserve the rich cultural heritage that binds us together. It was out of the blue when a childhood friend of mine, Donovan Kramer, called me up one evening after years of radio silence. He didn't waste much time on pleasantries. Hey, mate. Can I crash at your place for a few days? I need to get the hell out of Dodge for a bit. He begged. This didn't surprise me much. Donovan had always been the kind of guy who accumulated debt and trouble like people accumulate fridge magnets. Sure, I said. Just don't bring any of that trouble to my doorstep. Of course you know me. He replied with an uneasy chuckle that suggested just the opposite. It was the last week of August in 2002, and I had just moved into a new house in San Francisco, so I figured why not catch up with an old buddy. He arrived later that evening, and before long, we were reminiscing about old times over a couple beers. As we talked and laughed, poking fun at each other's choices in life, the evening stretched on uneventfully. As we ventured around the city together over the next few days, people greeted Donovan by name, gym owners, 
bartenders, even police officers seemed to recognize him. When I asked how he knew all these people, he'd just say we had crossed paths before or brush it off with a grin. On the fourth day, we went for dinner at a local diner that Donovan claimed to love. As we were leaving, he said goodbye to one of the waitresses, Abby Torres, who waved back at him nervously. Just as she turned away from us, something caught her eye near some bushes behind the restaurant. We walked towards Abby as she hesitated before shouting out, Daniel? Is that you? The figure emerged from the shadows, only for us to realize that it wasn't Daniel but Austin Bledsoe, a thirteen-year-old I had never seen before. However, Donovan recognized him immediately as his estranged sister's son. Austin's eyes were a deep black color that sent chills down my spine. He told Abby how a nice man had been keeping him safe, but he couldn't stay there anymore. Abby looked terrified, but she agreed to help, and we all agreed to meet at Donovan's sister's place after work the next day. The next evening, Donovan and I arrived at Helen's house early to explain the situation to her. She could hardly speak but managed to say, Last week, someone broke into my house, and Austin was gone. Her eyes widened in terror when I mentioned Austin's black eyes. We all went to the diner together, where Abby led us around the back of the restaurant to an old van parked nearby. Our hearts pounded in anticipation as she opened the door. My adrenaline spiked as I saw ropes tied up where Austin had been restrained just hours earlier. A pile of disturbing drawings depicted gruesome scenes with body parts strewn around and mysterious shadows lurking in the corners, all signed by Austin himself. While we looked closer at these chilling drawings, Abby divulged details, avoiding eye contact with Helen, a local crime boss named Marlon, the Viper. Slate had taken Austin and turned him into a killer's apprentice, teaching him how to stalk, maim, and kill his subjects, hoping one day he'd be just as ruthless and cruel as himself. As Donovan tried and failed to comfort his sister, I realized that nothing would be the same. The discovery of these drawings marked the beginning of a haunting descent into a terrifying world none of us were prepared for. From that moment on, our lives changed forever. As weeks rolled into months, Marlon's slate held an oppressive weight over our shoulders. We struggled to wrap our minds around Austin's actions, driven by an evil so malevolent it would be forever etched into our memory. We could never share the horrid details we discovered, and Helen would never accept Austin's actions, always wondering if the truth was far worse than we let on. In an effort to restore some semblance of normalcy, we set out to investigate Marlon's slate and the extent of his criminal empire. It became clear that in order to protect Austin and heal the wounds that had formed in our lives, we needed to dismantle Marlon's operation and bring him to justice. Donovan and I volunteered to do the legwork gathering intelligence from his contacts around the city while Abby cared for Helen and Austin. As we delved deeper into Marlon's twisted world, we uncovered a complex web of crime, deceit, and violence that had seeped into every corner of San Francisco. In uncovering the dark secrets and transgressions that Marlon's reign had wrought, we felt the oppressive weight of his evil were on our souls making every step harder than the last. However, despite the odds stacked against us, our shared resolve solidified a bond between Donovan, Abby, Helen, and me, one that only grew stronger as we continued our harrowing quest for justice. It was this formidable bond that would eventually help us weaken Marlon's diabolical grip over the city and rid ourselves of the torment he'd caused in all our lives. Although each day brought unimaginable challenges and tested the limits of our strength and courage, it also brought hope, hope that perhaps one day soon, our collective anguish may come to an end, 
leaving us free to put these ghastly events behind us and rebuild what was once broken. You know, it's funny how life works sometimes. One moment, you're sitting at your favorite bar with your best friends, enjoying a cold beer, and reminiscing about the good old days. The next, you're plunged into a living nightmare that will change everything you thought you knew about the world. It all started that fateful summer night in Huntsville, Alabama, where my buddies and I met up for our weekly ritual. As an electrician at the local power company, I had a relatively normal life, just working hard by day and hanging out with friends by night. That night was supposed to be just like any other, but little did we know what would unfold just hours later. My name is Jackson Radcliffe, by the way, and trust me when I tell you this tale is nearly impossible to believe. But it happened. It happened to me, someone who had always been skeptical about things like paranormal activities or creatures lurking in the shadows. As we left the bar that night, my friend Cody suggested we take a drive up near Lake Guntersville to finish off a perfect evening of stargazing. There was no reason not to. It seemed like such an innocuous idea at the time. When we arrived at our spot by the lake, everything seemed normal though there was an eerie stillness in the air. As men do, we ribbed each other mercilessly, cracked open another round of beers, and puffed away at cigarettes while taking in the breathtaking view of the night sky above us. Hours passed until Silas, the most skeptical of all of us, broke our laughter with a sudden and very real fear in his voice. Hey guys, he whispered shakily, do you see that over there? By those trees? We squinted our eyes to focus on where Silas was pointing but saw nothing tangible, just shadows playing tricks on us. At least, that's what we thought until we heard it. The sound of branches snapping and a low, guttural growl sent a chill down our spines. This was followed by the appearance of an enormous beast that seemed straight out of a legend rather than reality. It stood taller than all of us combined, easily eight feet tall, covered in coarse fur, with eyes that sparkled with intelligence and malice. Despite our disbelief at what we were seeing, the unmistakable smell of damp earth and blood confirmed the otherworldly creature's presence. Our initial shock quickly gave way to panic as the creature lunged forward, grabbing our buddy Mark by the throat and tossing him aside like a ragdoll. The savage attack ripped gory claw marks deep into his flesh, and he lay sprawled on the ground as blood pooled around him. It became quickly clear that Bigfoot wasn't just a myth. This massive beast seemingly willed itself into existence before our very eyes, escalating its violence in a most frightening way. We scrambled to put distance between ourselves and this monster, and realized we needed a plan if any of us were going to make it out of this encounter alive. In the midst of chaos, past news reports started to make sense, reports about mysterious disappearances and killings in the area that previously seemed like baseless rumors. People whispered about an enormous creature stalking folks who dared venture too near its lair. Nobody knew facts or details, but tonight, things suddenly became horrifyingly real. Back at Cody's truck, we discovered he brought his hunting rifle, intending to do some target practice near the lake. Now armed with more than just fear, we decided it was time to take a stand against this creature or die trying. The next few hours were marked by adrenaline-fueled terror as we faced off against this relentless monster. We managed to wound it with precise shots but found ourselves growing fatigued as it continued the onslaught. As dawn broke, we realized our luck was running out. Unexpectedly, a gunshot rang through the woods, startling the creature and causing it to retreat temporarily. 
That's when we saw Sheriff Mitchell, a local law enforcement officer known for his uncanny ability to track down trouble. Taking advantage of this brief reprieve, we regrouped and began to put together the pieces of this horrifying puzzle. Through meticulous research, we discovered various reports of similar events traced back several decades that seemed to confirm the existence of Bigfoot. It dawned on me that disbelief provided the perfect cover for this violent creature to prey on unsuspecting victims. Armed with this knowledge and the backing of Sheriff Mitchell, we vowed to bring an end to the creature's reign of terror. Over the next several weeks, we banded together as a unique team of hunters, using all available resources to track and ultimately confront Bigfoot once more. The final battle was a harrowing and brutal fight that nearly cost us our lives, but we emerged victorious. Our story quickly became the stuff of legends in Huntsville. Our once mundane lives were forever changed by the events that summer night at Lake Guntersville. As for Bigfoot, it served as a constant reminder that sometimes the unbelievable is much closer to reality than one might think. We became advocates for open-mindedness and urged others to face any inexplicable phenomena they encountered head-on. After all, it was fear and denial that allowed this creature to wreak havoc for so long undetected. As for Mark, he made a full recovery from his injuries and rejoined our tight-knit group with a newfound appreciation for life. As we reflected on what transpired, we bonded even deeper as friends knowing that we faced true evil together and survived. In the years that followed, whispers of supernatural occurrences continued to circulate throughout Huntsville. Whether it's simply residual fear or something deeper lurking in those dark woods remains unknown, but I'm sure we'll be there to face it when the time comes. It all started on a seemingly ordinary night, the air thick with tension as it hung around me like an unspoken secret, and yet I couldn't quite put my finger on it. Smoothing out the wrinkles in my park ranger uniform, I glanced briefly at my reflection in the rearview mirror of my patrol truck. My name is Aachen Ghost Crow, and being a Sioux native, I couldn't be prouder to protect these sacred lands that my ancestors called home for generations. I'd been working as a park ranger for a few years now, but that particular night felt different. Driving along the winding dirt roads through the dense woodland, I turned on my radio just in time to overhear a distress call from a fellow ranger named Nokosi Azurwolf. He reported some unexplainable tracks at the edge of a clearing near an abandoned cabin. Slightly puzzled, we both tried to keep our apprehensions at bay. As I reached the location, Nokosi started pointing out some large footprints in the dirt. They were certainly like nothing either of us had ever seen, elongated and deeply imprinted, with sharp claw marks slashing into the soil around them. Pausing for a moment to light up cigarettes and share our theories, we couldn't shake off an uneasy feeling growing within us. Tired and frustrated after hours of vain efforts to identify what could have left such strange tracks behind, we decided to split up with our flashlights. Nokosi headed deeper into the woods while I ventured toward the derelict cabin we'd come across earlier. Before long, an ear-piercing scream cut through the silence like eyes slicing through flesh. It was Nokosi's voice, or what remained of it. Wasting no time pondering over his safety or where this dreaded sound originated from, I bolted back to where we'd first met up. To my horror, I found Nokosi's mutilated body, his limbs contorted awkwardly as he lay motionless on the forest floor. The sight was enough to make me wretch, and my blood ran cold as I recognized the same bizarre claw marks from our earlier discovery, now carved deep into Nokosi's lifeless form. 
gripped with terror and convinced that whatever sinister creature had followed us now had our scent, I scrambled back to my truck. As I turned the ignition key, the engine roared to life, just as a monstrous figure emerged from the shadows. Its eyes glowed malevolently in my headlights, while its towering presence instilled a bone-chilling fear that numbed my senses. The snarling creature lunged at me with vicious intent, but fury and adrenaline propelled me forward as I floored the accelerator, narrowly escaping its lethal grasp. I made it to safety that night, but not without consequence. Our tranquil world would never be the same again. Days later, after piecing together fragments of folklore and legend passed down by the elders, the terror we'd faced had a name, Kizhuk, an ancient nightmare long whispered only in hushed tones within these sacred lands. To this day, it remains unclear what brought Kizhuk forth on that fateful night. Its sinister reign endures, stalking, hunting, and preying upon unknowing souls who dare stray too close. What haunted me most was not the tale itself, but the lingering knowledge that even with every possible measure of protection, no sanctuary could ever be found amidst such unfathomable darkness. For once you uncover a beast's dark secrets, it forever torments your mind with terror. In the aftermath of Nokosi's tragic death, I found myself grappling with the reality of what had unfolded before my eyes. The weight of loss and the unsettling presence of Kizhuk haunted my every waking moment. Park officials made futile efforts to investigate the incident but were understandably ill-equipped to confront something so otherworldly. With a deep sense of obligation to protect those who ventured onto sacred ground, as well as the memory of my fallen colleague, I immersed myself in researching possible methods to counteract this malevolent creature. I began seeking counsel from tribal elders and shamanic healers, delving into a hidden world of arcane practices. Some nights, I would sit by the campfire with them, mesmerized by their ritualistic chanting as they passed down powerful incantations for protection against Kizhuk. Gradually, I learned to harness my own faculties to confront the terror that lurked in these woods. Over time, tales of my encounters with Kizhuk spread throughout the region. Locals began referring to me as the Guardian, a vigilante figure who stood as their last line of defense from the darkness. In truth, it wasn't a title I ever sought for myself. It came solely from my unwavering desire to preserve these sacred lands that bore witness to generations upon generations of spiritual connection. As months turned into years, my resilience was tested time and again by this unpredictable being. Each encounter bred an excruciating blend of terror and bitter resolve within me, yet, curiously enough, there grew reverence for this ancient creature that had grown relentless in its pursuit of unknowing souls. To this day, when people ask about my battles against Kizhuk, or how I maintain an unrelenting sense of duty amidst persistent horrors, I recount not only those heart-stopping encounters but also the deeper lessons embedded within them, that in the face of unspeakable darkness, the human spirit proves its might through unwavering determination and an unbreakable bond to its ancestral roots. Why was I out here in the first place? Honestly, I couldn't even remember. My name is Benton Anders. There I was, in the backwoods of a popular location in the USA, somewhere I'd never been before. The dense forest seemed to stretch on forever, and with every step, the isolation deepened. I had taken this trip as a last-minute decision, a chance to get away from the hustle and bustle of my life as an IT consultant. The break was supposed to clear my head and give me some much-needed relief. Little did I know, it would turn out to be anything but. By the third day of my hike, 
I had reached a small clearing where I set up camp for the night. As the dying embers of my fire fought against the encroaching darkness, my thoughts were suddenly interrupted by a distant rustle in the bushes. Probably just an animal, I told myself, trying to ignore the unease creeping into my gut. But then came another rustle, louder than before and unmistakably closer. Instinct kicked in. Something was definitely wrong. The next morning, having managed to sleep a few hours after convincing myself that it was just an overly curious bear or deer passing through, I set out once more on my hike. It wasn't long before I realized something had changed. There were marks on the trees, deep scratches that had stripped away bark and marred the wood underneath. Framed by those scars were muddy footprints that led me toward a remote shack hidden further away from the trail. My curiosity peaked, and against any reasonable judgment, I followed those prints towards their destination. What harm could it do? When I finally stumbled upon this decrepit dwelling, its dark timbers groaned under their own weight, while rotting planks covered murky windows from within. Though it appeared abandoned at first glance, someone or something had recently passed through. The door to the shack was cracked open. I hesitated before stepping inside, uncertain of what I'd find. But as someone who had always been skeptical of the uncanny and the paranormal, I disregarded my growing apprehension. Upon entering, it became quite clear that this was no ordinary home. The repugnant stench of decomposing flesh hit me like a brick wall, cutting into my breathless gasps for fresh air. In the dim rays of sunlight that filtered through cracks in the walls, I saw carcasses strewn across the filthy floor. Skinned and gutted, they were a sight that had no place in anyone's worst nightmares. As I tried to back away, my shaking foot caught on a gnarled root jutting out from beneath an overturned chair. A sudden noise made me spin around, and there he stood. A towering man with ragged clothes and an unkempt beard, his wide eyes set deeply into his dirt-smeared face. He stared at me with unbridled malevolence. I had heard of hillbillies inhabiting these woods, reclusive folk who wanted nothing to do with the outside world. But this man, he was something entirely different. Before I could react, he grabbed me with gnarled hands, a monstrous grin twisting his face grotesquely as he breathed threats into my ear. Every vile word left no doubt that his intentions were far from harmless. With all the strength I could muster, I managed to break free and bolt towards my campsite. My frenzied flight was only fueled by blind fear. Hope reigned supreme as trees that once seemed so dense now offered concealment from my pursuer. Miraculously, I eventually stumbled onto a dirt road, where a truck driver passing through managed to pick me up and whisk me away from my nightmarish encounter back to civilization. Days later, when recounting my experience to a local I met during my ordeal, I learned about Abner Crockett the man who had almost made me his latest victim. He had once been a man of faith, devoted to his family and community. But after suffering a major tragedy years ago, he vanished into the backwoods, and nothing would ever be the same. Some whispered of the feral madness that had overtaken him as he grew more secluded from society. Abner descended into a delirium of violence and bloodlust. I wondered how many unsuspecting hikers had their lives viciously ripped from them. I shuddered at the thought, and couldn't help but feel a sense of immense gratitude that I had managed to escape the clutches of such a deranged individual. The haunting memories of my narrow escape remained etched in my mind, serving as a grim reminder of how life can take unexpected turns. As I stepped back into my mundane world, the wounds began to heal slowly. However, the scars left me with an irrepressible urge to learn more about the dark side of human nature, which led someone like Abner Crockett to spiral down this deadly abyss. 
I found solace in literature and online forums dedicated to survival stories, exploring the human psyche's nooks and crannies. Delving into such narratives helped me make sense of my experience and connect with others who had survived similar brushes with danger. As months turned to years, sharing my own story became a passion, one that I embraced wholeheartedly. Eventually, I decided to join a support group that reached out to victims of violence who sought closure or simply someone who would listen without judgment. Over time, listening to and sometimes relating to their harrowing tales enriched my understanding of what makes humans capable of committing horrific acts or succumbing to their darkest impulses. The unsettling encounter with Abner Crockett became an unlikely catalyst for change in my life. Despite living with dark thoughts that occasionally swirled in my mind's corners, transforming that fateful trip into something meaningful allowed me to heal and make peace with the past. Some nights, when the darkness is particularly heavy and stifling, I still find myself thinking about those gnashing teeth and dead eyes bearing down on me in those woods. When they come, I remind myself that I was one who escaped and am now helping others do the same by sharing our stories, facing our fears together, and finding solace within the collective strength of the survivors. Sometimes, in life, the things we can't see or explain are the very sources of our nightmares. It was the summer of 2008. I had recently started my job as a park ranger at Yosemite National Park. Summer days seemed to stretch into infinity, filled with laughter and pleasant encounters with hikers and campers. But soon, I would find out that not everything in this seemingly perfect oasis shared such innocence. My third day at the job started much like the others. As I sipped my coffee and gazed out onto the vast land of green and mountainous terrain, I couldn't help but feel grateful for where fate had landed me. My parents, Odomi Garner and Elsie Yazzie, had often remarked on my lucky stars, ever since I spent my childhood roaming our Creek Nation Reservation in Oklahoma. Little did any of us know that luck would be challenged on this fateful day. On my daily patrol through the trails, I came across a group of jovial tourists from Germany who were hilariously attempting to pronounce English trail names. As we chuckled together and engaged in small talk, one of them asked about an odd arrangement of rocks they'd seen earlier that day. Intrigued and somewhat puzzled by their findings, I decided to take a look myself. I followed their directions to a secluded area off the beaten path. At first glance, the formation appeared innocuous. Rocks piled up in a circle with an eerie precision, but it radiated an air of discomfort that felt anything but natural. I quickly snapped a picture and assured myself that I would investigate further after returning to my office. Later that evening, back at my cabin, curiosity was eating away at me like hungry squirrels on neglected camp food, so I decided to call an older ranger friend, Sam Greycloud, who had served these lands for decades. After describing what I'd seen earlier that day, Sam cautiously told me about a forest creature that had haunted the Yosemite people since time immemorial. The Ikokuren, as he called it, was an ethereal being that stalked and tormented those who strayed too far from the safety of their campsites. Ikokuren was known for staging meticulous rock displays like the one I discovered, which marked victims' territory for future torment. Chills raced down my spine as Sam hesitantly recounted the story. At first, I dismissed Sam's tale as an old Native American legend, but the following evening found me preoccupied with a sense of lurking dread as I embarked on my night patrol. It wasn't until I approached a remote campsite that I heard blood-curdling screams pierce through the tranquil air. Rushing to their aid, 
I arrived to find a terrified family pressed closely together, their eyes wild with fear, each recounting what they'd just seen. An inhuman figure had seemingly appeared out of thin air, standing at the edge of their campsite before vanishing back into the shadows. Suddenly, they all pointed out a second arrangement of rocks near their tent. With my chest tightening and my blood running cold, I realized that this was no longer about cryptic legends or chance encounters. This family had been marked by the Ikokurin, and so had I. Overcoming our fear but remaining vigilant, we quickly packed up and escorted them out of the park. The next day, when recounting our experiences to other rangers and showing them my photo evidence, it was suggested that we had all collectively witnessed a menacing coyote or overly aggressive bear caught in some strange habit. But deep down, I knew that couldn't be true. The way those rocks were arranged, so sinisterly unnatural, clearly had been orchestrated by something crueler than any wildlife could ever offer. As days bled into weeks, whispers of rock formations and strange sightings spread like wildfire through Yosemite. More rangers and campers were targeted by E. Kokurin, trapped in a horrifying cat and mouse game. Eventually, hope of ever identifying the true nature of what haunted our park was lost. But we adapted, with this sinister lurking presence eventually becoming part of the park's more modern lore. To this day, I still venture into the heart of Yosemite with a sense of wary apprehension, aware that the E. Kokurin could be watching us from just out of sight. Despite the ever-present unease, life at the park went on. With an increasing number of tourists visiting Yosemite each year, it was essential for us rangers to ensure their safety while also practicing caution ourselves. We began incorporating subtle safety measures into our daily routines and frequently updated park guidelines to minimize encounters with the Ikokurin. While we couldn't outright warn visitors of the forest creature without sparking fear and disbelief, we made sure to remind them never to wander too far from their designated campsites or tamper with any unusual rock formations. As its haunting seemed confined within particular boundaries, I developed a deep-rooted respect for this enigmatic force, an understanding that we coexisted in this vast expanse of wilderness but would never fully understand one another. The years passed, and most of the staff and visitors continued to chalk up these inexplicable experiences to overactive imaginations or woodland superstitions. But some couldn't shake off the eerie sensation that our mere presence in Yosemite was sometimes merely tolerated by a being much older and more powerful than ourselves. And every time I ventured deep into the heart of Yosemite, I approached it with an entirely different mindset, equal parts reverence, curiosity, and humble acknowledgement of my place within a world where ancient legends still thrive in the darkest corners of our modern perceptions. I still remember the incident like it was yesterday, even though it's been a couple of years now. It was a regular evening, and my friends and I had decided to meet up at our favorite coffee shop in New York City's Soho neighborhood. Located near the Hudson River and filled with hip boutiques and art galleries, the shop was a popular spot for people our age. We arrived at around 6 p.m. I sat down at a table with my friends, Sophia, Ethan, and Trey ready to enjoy some delicious pastries and catch up on each other's lives. Unbeknownst to me, that day would change the course of my life forever. My name is Bennett Falconer, an average 26-year-old graphic designer from Brooklyn. Little did I know that my world was about to be turned upside down. As we hung out in the coffee shop, laughing about Ethan's not-so-funny work stories, we couldn't help but notice a group of kids outside who seemed a bit off. 
appearing to be around 10 to 12 years old with strangely dark eyes that sent shivers down our spines despite being harmless children. Not wanting to seem judgmental or alarmist, we shrugged off our wariness as a rational fear and continued chatting. But soon enough, we couldn't ignore the unsettling feeling any longer when one of the kids, a girl called Adelaide with an icy stare that seemed to pierce right through you, approached our window. At first glance, her actions seemed harmless. She just stood there looking inside the shop. But we quickly felt something deep and sinister lingering beneath her steady gaze. Tension grew among my friends, but we tried not to let our imaginations run wild. As time went by, more accidents started happening in Soho. People were injured or worse during seemingly random incidents involving these black-eyed children, who always seemed to appear on the periphery. They moved through the streets like shadows, always lurking nearby as if stalking their prey. After a few weeks of uneasy whispers and terrified looks exchanged between locals, the situation escalated. My friend Sophia was walking home from work one night when she encountered Adelaide again. Only minutes later, Sophia was found on the ground bleeding and unable to speak. In a horrifying twist, she barely survived the incident but had no memory or explanation for what had happened to her, only Adelaide's name. The incidents grew in frequency and intensity with each passing day. We began searching for any information we could on these black-eyed children, desperate for answers. It seemed as though they possessed an unnatural ability to wreak havoc on our community by toying with people's emotions and causing real pain and injury. Through exhaustive research and harrowing accounts from witnesses, we gradually unraveled Adelaide's story. The girl was a transient spirit somehow connected to the very foundation of Soho itself. There were few records of her beyond old newspapers, which documented a gruesome murder-suicide in a tenement building long since demolished where she had lived. Realization dawned that these villainous children were drawing power from unwitting victims' fear and pain, becoming stronger and bolder with each attack. We banded together to fight back in a desperate attempt to banish their sinister influence. As weeks turned into months, tensions in Soho rose to unprecedented levels. Yet despite the danger we faced daily, our community stood strong, refusing to succumb to fear or abandon hope. It wasn't until much later that we would piece together all the clues that led us to confront Adelaide herself in one final showdown. In a fierce struggle against unimaginable horror, we liberated ourselves at last from the malicious entities that once haunted our lives. Ultimately, life in Soho moved on and gradually regained some semblance of normalcy after that fateful day of confronting Adelaide. Though the city still carries the scars of its brush with darkness, it now serves as a reminder of the power of courage and determination in the face of malevolence. The years that have passed since that harrowing encounter with Adelaide have left their mark on me and my friends. Each of us has grown stronger and more resilient, as if the fight we waged against the darkness united us in an unspoken bond. Although we occasionally bring up the topic, none of us can truly explain everything we experienced during those terrifying months. The black-eyed children and their sinister touch have become a memory vivid but slowly fading into the background along with the rest of our past. Soho has evolved too, with new generations taking to its streets, unaware of the old battles fought for their lives. Fresh art adorns its gallery walls, while trendy boutiques keep drawing fresh crowds to this vibrant hub. While nothing can erase what transpired within its limits, the neighborhood has become a testament to human strength and our unwavering will to protect one another from any lurking evil. As for me, I continue to explore life, now with an indelible mindfulness of how fragile and fleeting it can be, forever grateful for whatever force guided us through that dark chapter in our lives.
Sometimes I wonder if our deepest fears are simply the echoes of ancient memories, passed down through generations like a shadowy family heirloom. My name is Roderick Falconhust, and I didn't believe in these otherworldly tales until that fateful day. I was working as a landscape photographer in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. It was Wednesday, October 14th, and I had just left a client meeting. The beaches were great for business, but I had been craving some solace in the dense forests nearby. I rounded up my friends, Dean, a boisterous bartender who could make anyone laugh, and Audrey, an enigmatic librarian whose curiosity was insatiable. We decided to take a spontaneous road trip to Everglades National Park. Everything felt normal when we arrived at the park, with laughter filling the air as we began our trek along one of the many winding trails. The light filtered through the trees with an enchanting glow as we took in the beautiful surroundings. As we moved deeper into nature's embrace, we saw something strange. What looked like an improvised campsite was scattered belongings strewn about, clothes, maps, even some photographic equipment, that clearly had been abandoned in a hurry. Puzzled by this seemingly innocuous discovery, we began investigating the area for any signs of distress or indication as to why these items were left behind. That's when Dean discovered unusual footprints nearby. Definitely not human too large and with peculiar toe formations. Our shared amusement slowly turned to apprehension as night fell upon us suddenly and without warning. Hey, Audrey whispered hesitantly. Do you guys feel like there's someone watching us? We tried to shake off our uneasiness with jokes and banter but found ourselves growing increasingly tense. Before long, it was as if every snap of a twig or rustle of leaves amplified this eerie feeling that we were being stalked by an unseen force. And then it happened. Audrey, lagging slightly behind, let out a blood-curdling scream. Dean and I spun around, only to catch a fleeting glimpse of a towering figure disappearing into the darkness. She sobbed in terror as she recounted this horrifying being, ape-like in appearance almost human but not quite, and exuding a palpable sense of malevolence. The terrifying realization dawned on us that we had crossed paths with the legendary Bigfoot. We began sprinting towards the nearest park ranger station, certain that we were being pursued by this monstrous creature. Panic set in as screams echoed in the night air and more viscous footprints materialized before us. Our hearts raced as we desperately ran for our lives. Eventually, miraculously, we stumbled upon the ranger station. Breathless with adrenaline and terror, we recounted our tale to Ranger Matthews, who went pale before sharing details of ominous disappearances and bizarre sightings throughout the park's history. As an expert on local wildlife and history, Matthews revealed that the skunk ape was said to be responsible for countless unexplained deaths in the area, humans and animals alike. Its existence was a well-kept secret among the locals, who lived in constant fear. And although we survived that harrowing night, I can't help but feel haunted by our encounter with Bigfoot. Descending into an abyss of dread and paranoia, I made it a mission to research and understand this enigmatic murderer, but what I found only led to more questions than answers. My life is now consumed by this obsession, and regardless of what others may believe about the mysterious Bigfoot or skunk ape lurking in our nightmares, one thing's for sure, I know what I saw that night in the depths of Everglades National Park and the fear it ignited within me will never be extinguished. Ever since that fateful encounter, I have dedicated my life to uncovering the truth about this elusive creature. My days are filled with research and interviews, combing through historical archives, and speaking with those who claim to have had their own terrifying brush with the beast. With each new piece of evidence I uncover, 
it seems the complexity of the puzzle only increases. While many dismiss my quest as folly or obsession, there are others who confide in me and thank me for exposing their nightmares to the light of day and for giving credence to their stories, once thought too frightening or fantastical to be true. In the years that followed our spine-chilling experience, Dean moved away from Fort Lauderdale, driven by a constant sense of unease to find solace in safer places. Audrey, too, has been changed by that night. Her once endless curiosity is now tempered by caution and apprehension. As for me, my thirst for answers remains unquenched. I've traveled far and wide, from the Pacific Northwest to the dense forests of northern India, piecing together an intriguing network of sightings and myths, each a small part of a larger tapestry woven over centuries. The more I learn about Bigfoot, and its kindred spirits around the world, the more I realize that our fears may indeed stem from something as primordial as these timeless creatures themselves. A residual terror buried deep within our very souls, linking us to distant ancestors who fled from these formidable beings in ancient forests long since forgotten. Whether they hide on secluded mountain peaks or lurk beneath murky swampland shrouded in mist, one thing is certain, these enigmatic hominids have stalked our planet for countless generations and will continue to do so as long as shadows fall in the twilight hours. With each passing day, my journey into their world takes me down darker pathways and further from what I once believed reality to be. I cannot turn back now, the truth must be discovered, no matter how unbelievable or unsettling it may be. For as long as the unanswered question of Bigfoot's existence plagues my mind, my restless search continues, and I am prepared to venture into the heart of darkness itself to confront these phantoms of our past and finally uncover the secrets they so fiercely guard. It was 3.45 a.m. on a quiet September night, and I was making my usual rounds through the park as a Sioux native park ranger. Things were pretty routine until I stumbled upon something eerily out of place near the lake, a torn, bloody backpack. Hey, John, are you seeing this? I asked my partner over the walkie-talkie, keeping my eyes fixed on that ominous backpack. Yeah, I just found some scraps of clothing here too, John replied cautiously. It looks like something bad happened. My name is Thomas Nice Shadow, and that night would forever change my life. Growing up in the Sioux tribe, I was immersed in nature from an early age and became passionate about safeguarding our tribal lands as a park ranger. My partner, John Whitehawk, had similar passions and together we vowed to uphold the safety of our community. As we surveyed the scene further, we discovered a trail of blood leading deeper into the woods. Following it cautiously, we stumbled upon a ghastly sight. Human remains scattered all around with claw marks and signs of struggle surrounding them. My heart pounded as fear crept in slowly, but there was something else too, an air of mystery that compelled me to find out what had happened. Trying to maintain professionalism, I radioed in for backup and a forensics team to investigate the scene. Then John and I began exploring further for clues. As we continued our search, we stumbled upon new characters entangled in this tragic event. Gary Wharton and Jessica Evans, two hikers who somehow got caught in the crossfire. I swear we didn't see anything. Jessica sobbed as she tried to catch her breath after outrunning whatever had chased them. It just came out of nowhere. That poor person. Gary explained that they'd met Tim, whom they only knew by his first name, earlier that day as they embarked on what was supposed to be a peaceful camping trip. Everything seemed normal until night fell and suddenly something unspeakable attacked. 
We led Gary and Jessica to safety and continued our investigation. Every detail was crucial, but nothing prepared us for the monstrous truth we'd eventually uncover. The attacker was none other than Rakia, an ancient creature from American native folklore known for its relentless hunting and brutal violence. In one heart-stopping moment of revelation, we realized that we were in far deeper danger than we'd ever anticipated. The next few weeks were filled with dread and anticipation as Rakia's presence tormented our once peaceful land. It had torn apart families and threatened the very fabric of our community, as it savagely hunted down anyone who crossed its path. The killings were relentless, each one more gruesome and elaborate than the last. We did everything we could to fight back, setting up traps and attempting to predict its patterns of attack, but the creature was several steps ahead of us at all times. Desperation heightened as townsfolk began turning against each other in fear and paranoia. Through our investigations, we were able to piece together that this creature had specifically sought out our tribal land for some unknown reason connected to darker elements of the park's history. While it remained ambiguous whether Rakia's origins were rooted in vengeance or twisted supernatural force, one thing was certain it would not stop until it finished what it had started. As the killings continued, so did our pursuit. Days turned into weeks, but finally, an opportunity appeared, a chance to confront Rikia head-on. With terror-laden hearts, we powered forward into the confrontation that would determine our fate. Sweat-soaked and frantic, we managed to corner the beast in an isolated cave. Blasts of gunfire echoed off the cavern walls as we futilely tried to bring it down. In the chaos, it lunged for me, but in a heart-stopping moment, Sean, a wildlife officer who had joined our efforts, threw himself in its path. His dying scream was the last thing I heard before the cave collapsed. Despite losing so much in our battle against this merciless creature, Rakia's vanishing in the rubble offered us an uneasy resolution. As days passed without any sign of its deadly presence, we began to believe that it might have been buried for good. But even after all these years, I still find myself looking over my shoulder and wondering if Rakia will one day resurface to finish what it started. The memory of that horrifying creature and the suffering it caused continues to haunt me pushing me to work even harder as a park ranger to ensure the safety of our land and people. John and I have dedicated our lives to investigating other ancient legends and supernatural mysteries, as well as preserving our Sioux tribe's cultural heritage. We know that knowledge is our best weapon against the unknown, and we must remain vigilant so that nothing like this ever happens again. Our bond with nature has only strengthened through these trials, reminding us that we are protectors of not only our community, but also the vast expanse of wilderness around us. We carry on for those we lost, for the hope of a safer tomorrow, and for the unbending determination that defines who we are, soon native park rangers standing watch over the land we hold dear. Why did I agree to that bet? I still don't understand. One of those stupid challenges during a particularly foggy night at our local bar. The Shady Oak. Decided the fate of my friends and me. You see, a few drinks in, things got rowdy, and we found ourselves arguing about who could survive a weekend in the backwoods of Tennessee. The loser would have to pay for everyone's bar tab that night. I'm Joe Stafford, by the way, a marketing consultant from New York City who decided to leave the concrete jungle to settle down with my high school sweetheart in our quaint little hometown nestled in the mountains. It was an auspicious reunion because she also divorced and stalked old flames on social media to remind herself of clearer days when nobody died. Back to the story. 
Our little group consisted of four middle-aged men with more bravado than sense. Me, Dave Kravitz, a local mechanic who loved riding his Harley. Eric Barnes, a school teacher who taught history with an unmatched passion bordering on insanity. And finally Seth Jensen, a software engineer working for some big shot company remotely from here. We all agreed with varying levels of enthusiasm to spend three days and two nights in one of the most isolated cabins we could find deep within those Appalachian woods. Arriving on a Friday afternoon through winding roads and rocky terrain, Seth asked nonchalantly, as if it wasn't bothering him at all. Hey guys, isn't this where that unsolved murder happened like 20 years ago? With an annoyed tone, Dave replied, Shut it, Seth. Stop trying to scare us. Little did we know. Our adventure began like any other backwoods outing, setting up camp, unpacking gear, and firing up the grill for some steaks. Then we heard rustling just beyond our sight line. It was hastily dismissed as wildlife until strange occurrences continued throughout the night. Only when we found those peculiar footprints just a bit too humanoid to belong to the local wildlife did we start to feel uneasy. Dave, paranoid by nature, acted as if he just stumbled upon another episode of Sons of Anarchy and kept talking about finding a hidden meth lab Seth, on the other hand, brushed everything off as some silly coincidence. We continued our weekend by fishing, hiking, and even managing to play a few rounds of poker inside the cabin by candlelight after losing power during a storm. The combination of adversities joined forces against us, creating an underlying tension that nobody dared mention explicitly. On the final night, despite our best efforts to ignore it, that weird feeling in our gut came to life. A cacophony of horrifying sounds approached the cabin from all directions, roaring engines, screams, laughter echoing through the trees, all accompanied by almost inhuman growls. In panic, we grabbed anything useful, tire iron, hunting knife, fishing gear, not knowing what or who was out there for us. Alarms sounded. Our deranged assailants finally showed themselves, a motley bunch of hillbillies with names like Nosy Jake and Scratchy Sam. Bursting through windows and clawing at doors with their bare hands and crude weapons, machetes, chainsaws, they tried to tear this cabin apart as if they'd been waiting for decades. Bloodied and bruised from our initially weak defensive measures upon understanding their predatory intentions, we fought them tooth and nail while realistic and palpable traces of fear easily seeped through every pore of our bodies. Despite my frantic attempts at reasoning, Why? What do you want from us? Their menacing grins only widened as they barked at each other in some foreign tribal dialect. Somewhere between the adrenaline-fueled desperation for survival and sheer luck, things took a turn our way. Hard blows with the tire iron and hunting knife managed to disable two of their pursuers. As a final push, Dave fought mightily before crashing through a barricaded window, making a daring escape that drew them away and gave us the precious time we needed to get out. A week later, we heard chilling news from Old Murphy, the weathered owner of the Shady Oak, revealing that our cabin rested on land once owned by a ruthless hillbilly clan who felt wrong when new tourists showed up in their territory. Those sadistic hillbillies were seeking revenge no matter how misplaced it was, on anyone intruding on their sacred grounds. The revelation left us shaken, but it also solidified the bond between our group, Dave, Eric, Seth, and me. The experience transformed us from old high school buddies reminiscing about former glories to eternally grateful survivors, having narrowly escaped the clutches of a vengeful and murderous past. We made a solemn promise never to let fear or superstition come between us again. And though we managed to heal physically from the ordeal, the emotional scars remained, lurking beneath the surface. From that point on, 
our gatherings at. The Shady Oak took on a more somber tone. We drank less, spoke in hushed whispers about our harrowing ordeal, and decided that maybe confidence and bravado were characteristics best left to those naive enough to underestimate the dark world that lay hidden within the depths of the Appalachian woods. The weight of our experience forever changed us into men who understood the thin line between life and death but also taught us to cherish each moment as if it could be our last. Why was I out here? That question loomed over my thoughts as I trudged deeper into the backwoods, far from any trace of civilization. My name is August Wardwell, and my job as a nature photographer often leads me on wild adventures. This time, though, something felt off, like there was an unseen force at play. These woods had a notoriously ominous reputation with stories of inexplicable events and unexplained disappearances, but that hadn't really bothered me at the time. Rationally speaking, people go missing for logical reasons, bad decisions and wrong turns. I just had no idea how much things would change for me or how that change would manifest as everything unfolded. The day had progressed smoothly overall. My camera clicked away at nature's wonders, trees' gnarled trunks, elegant wildlife, and the subtle beauty of sprawling creepers. There'd been talk in town about sightings of a rare bird species in this area. So, sure enough, it felt like just another typical assignment. As night approached, however, my sense of ease shifted. In hindsight, perhaps it was the long shadows cast by the setting sun playing tricks on my mind. Or maybe it was the penetrating gaze of a pair of cold black eyes that seemed to follow me from somewhere deep within the forest. My buddy Davis had agreed to accompany me on this assignment. We'd known each other since college and had gone on countless trips together. He walked ahead of me on the trail and called back jokingly. Hey August! You ever think about how these woods would be ideal for burying bodies? I waved off his inappropriate remark, but I couldn't shake that unnerving feeling I'd been experiencing. Night descended upon us like a suffocating cloak until our only recourse was to set up camp in a small clearing we stumbled upon while navigating through the pitch black darkness with our flashlights. As we sat around the campfire, Davis cracked open a beer and grinned at me. All right, dude. Time to let my amazing cooking skills shine. How do grilled hot dogs sound? He took out a package of hot dogs from his pack and carefully balanced it over the fire. Mid-bite into my first hot dog, the glaring sound of leaves crunching jolted me upright. We exchanged anxious glances. You hear that, August? Davis asked, his voice barely more than a whisper. I nodded, struggling to get a grip on my quickly escalating heartbeat. Let's check it out. We ventured forth cautiously, flashlights probing the dark unknown. More crunching noises. Swinging the flashlight around revealed brief glimpses of distressing scenes in the encroaching shadows. Blood splattered boulders, scraps of clothing stained with red. These images fueling a horrifying realization that we were anything but alone out here. Our terrified conjecture gained sudden validation as an overwhelming stench wafted through the air. Davis gasped, his flashlight illuminating a gut-wrenching display of mutilated body parts scattered across the ground and carnage marking numerous doomed attempts at escape. Then we saw him, a hulking figure shrouded in shadows his burly frame delineating an unmistakable presence capable of such monstrous acts. The slow turn of its head revealed a face twisted and scarred. This was Jebediah Crowley, a local recluse and rumored psychopath. My mind screamed. 
with no time to process or question why Jebediah had chosen this life or how he became consumed by violence and brutality. Adrenaline took over as we desperately sought any means of escape, ducking through tangled foliage and stumbling over gnarled roots in our frantic retreat. Escape attempts seemed destined to fail, though, with Jebediah's relentless pursuit closing in with each passing heartbeat. At last, we found ourselves cornered beside a treacherous ravine. A precariously narrow path was our only hope. Any chance of survival hinged on navigating this razor's edge, slippery and uncertain in the darkness. Suddenly, a single gunshot resounded through the forest, echoing one final, fleeting moment of absolute terror. Four days after our harrowing experience, we shared our account with the authorities, our desperate fight for information about the mysterious and seemingly unstoppable force that had pursued us relentlessly. The overwhelming response was silence. No one was willing to confirm or deny anything they'd heard about Jebediah Crowley, as if his very existence eluded inquiry. Taking matters into our own hands, we sought out local archives and newspaper records, anything that might offer a semblance of the truth. It turned out that Jebediah Crowley had been a recluse for decades, shunned by society due to a disfigurement he'd suffered as a child in a brutal farming accident. Over time, stories of his solitude morphed into legends of his bloodlust and cruelty, fueled largely by fearful gossip rather than hard evidence. As for the rare bird I originally set out to photograph, it seemed almost inconsequential against the backdrop of our harrowing ordeal. Still, it served as a bittersweet reminder of the initial purpose behind our trek into the woods, a purpose overshadowed by the terrifyingly real specter of Jebediah Crowley. In spite of the terror we'd faced, life moved on. Colleagues commended me for my photographic captures from that fateful trip, but none could fully comprehend just how much those images cost me and Davis, both physically and emotionally. In truth, we would never be the same again, forever marked by an unspoken bond that stemmed from our shared brush with death in those sinister woods. It was a Friday evening, just past six o'clock, when I stepped out of my office building in downtown Seattle. My name is Roman Ferguson, a software developer. The streets were bustling with people trying to make their way home or to their favorite bars and restaurants. The sound of laughter and conversations filled the air, but the usual camaraderie felt different that evening. The feeling of unease first hit me while waiting for my bus at the crowded stop. I casually looked around and locked eyes with a young boy standing by himself on the other side of the street. He had jet black hair and alabaster skin that seemed unnaturally pale under the streetlights. But what chilled me to the core were his pitch black eyes. It was as if they were staring right into my soul. When I got home, my roommate Josh noticed that something was off. You look like you've seen a ghost, man. He joked as he cracked open a beer. I told him about the boy with the black eyes and how it made my skin crawl. Josh is not usually an empathetic guy, but even he sobered up upon hearing my story. Over the next couple of days, my encounter seemed to gain more gravity in my mind. The same unusual darkness weaved in and out of conversations at work, in bars, and at bus stops, whispers of children with jet black eyes stalking people across town. Everyone had a different story. Some say they saw one kid, others swear it was a group of them. Late Sunday night, I received a call from an old high school friend named Luke, who worked as a detective for the police department. His voice shook as he told me there'd been a murder investigation at Kent City Park, one that left even experienced officers shaken to their cores. 
He wouldn't say much more than that over the phone, but I could sense genuine fear leaking through his words. After a sleepless night, Josh and I met Luke at a local coffee shop the following morning. As he sipped his black coffee, he filled us in on the horrifying details of the crime scene. The victim was found with severe lacerations and bite marks. Forensic units had never seen anything quite like it before, as the bite marks were far wider than any human could produce. What happened next took Seattle by storm. Over the course of two weeks, escalating violent incidents left bodies mauled and savagely torn apart all over the city. While official reports suggested a psychopathic killer was on the loose, those in the know whispered fearfully about something much darker, children with pitch black eyes. I became consumed by the thought of finding these sinister creatures, whatever they were. Together with Josh and Luke, we conducted our own off-the-record investigations after having too many sleepless nights and having no other options. We interviewed witnesses whose lives had been shattered by these encounters, researched old police reports that sounded eerily similar to our current reality, and collected newspaper clippings spanning decades from all across the country. My world changed one evening when an old woman named Evelyn approached us in a pub where we were discussing our findings. She overheard us talking about the black-eyed children and revealed that her granddaughter, Annabelle Jones, had been abducted years ago. One day she told her mother she was playing with a new friend, a child with eyes blacker than coal, and that was the last time Annabelle was seen alive. Evelyn connected us to others who'd had their lives destroyed by these malevolent children. These survivors banded together to search for answers, not just to help themselves but also to save future victims from a fate they couldn't comprehend. Through months of tireless investigating and digging through dark secrets no one should uncover, we finally discovered that these children weren't humans at all but ancient supernatural creatures that fed on fear and pain before taking the lives of their unsuspecting prey. Our final showdown with these monsters was a dark and desperate night in that old abandoned prison on the outskirts of town. In a blinding, visceral blur of blood, adrenaline, and pain, we fought against these agents of chaos. Some of us didn't make it out that night but those who did ensured those black-eyed creatures paid dearly for the terror they wrought upon our city. There's no telling if all of them were defeated or where they came from, but we did enough to send them back into whatever abyss they crawled out of. Sometimes I still hear stories, in hushed whispers, of sightings or unusual happenings in other cities across the country. But one thing is for certain, we in Seattle won't be forgetting those chilling weeks anytime soon. Time has moved on, and what remains of our unusual alliance has disbanded, with each member trying to pick up the pieces of their shattered lives. Josh, Luke, and I still catch up occasionally, over a beer at the local pub or a quiet dinner at home, but we can never escape the lingering shadows that those black-eyed children left behind. And although it's nearly impossible to feel safe again after such horrors, we've learned the true meaning of bravery and unity and vowed to face whatever lurks in the dark, no matter how terrifying it may be. I was sitting at that diner, you know, the one on Main Street, sipping my black coffee as the neon sign outside flickered. It wasn't an unusual Saturday night. I was just catching up on some work, occasionally glancing out the window. Things changed, though, when they walked in. Now, these weren't just your regular group of kids. They were different, and something about them felt eerily off. At first glance, they seemed normal. A couple of teenagers wearing hoodies and jeans were talking in hushed voices. But as they got closer to the counter next to me, I noticed their eyes, 
pitch black, soulless little orbs that sent a chill down my spine. Their names? I had no idea at that point. As the kids sat down and ordered their food, I couldn't help but listen in on their conversation. What I heard made me shiver. Details of some brutal attacks on people around town. Innocent folks just going about their lives. The vividness and accuracy of their descriptions were too unsettling to ignore. These encounters all started innocuously enough. A chance meeting while walking late in the evening or an unexpected knock at a door. Only to find one of these kids standing there with an unnerving smile. It became clear that they were stalking their prey with cunning strategy and malicious intent. From what they were saying, it seemed like these kids delighted in tormenting those they encountered by displaying violent acts before mercilessly maiming or killing them. I didn't want to believe it at first. Maybe it was just some sick role play? But as I listened more intently, my skepticism vanished. The details they were discussing couldn't be made up. After overhearing one more disturbing story of attack and bloodshed at a family's home nearby, I felt like my heart was about to explode from fear. It struck me that if these kids realized I knew too much, I could be their next target. I tried to stay as casual as possible, pretending to be absorbed in my work, but my hands were shaking. As I was formulating an escape plan in my mind, something even more terrifying happened. One of the kids looked directly at me, a sinister smile stretching across his face. He leaned over toward me and whispered, We know you're listening. In that moment, the fear and adrenaline propelled me into action, sending me bolting from the diner and frantically searching for my car keys as I sprinted to safety. As I pulled away with tires screeching, I saw them in my rearview mirror, those black-eyed kids who knew just what terror they were capable of unleashing. The following days were a blur of police reports and sleepless nights. Telling people what I had witnessed would have seemed delusional if it weren't for the recurring attacks around town that matched the tales of violence I had overheard. The cops couldn't seem to come up with any leads or suspects like these kids were ghosts. Only later did I overhear two detectives discussing what they'd discovered during their investigation. Apparently, these sinister children all shared the same mysterious background. They were adopted by a secretive organization with no discernible motive, save for unleashing chaos on unsuspecting victims. That night at the diner was one that changed my life forever. It made me question everything I thought I knew about our world, just how fragile our safety can be, and the existence of incomprehensible evil. My life after that night had become a constant loop of paranoia and fear. I made an effort to avoid dark alleys and suspicious strangers. As months went by, the attacks started to decrease in frequency and eventually stopped altogether. The police never managed to apprehend or even identify those black-eyed teenagers, and the investigations hit one dead end after another. Gradually, the town returned to its normal rhythm, but for me, the haunting memories remained all-consuming. I became more alert to my surroundings and researched everything there was to know about mysterious organizations with an intent to cause chaos. The experience infiltrated every aspect of my life, changing my daily habits and straining my relationships with friends and family. Sleep was a precious commodity that eluded me night after night as the faces of those teenagers haunted my dreams. Despite these changes in my life, I still sought answers for what had transpired in our town. My research led me down countless conspiracy theory rabbit holes desperate to make connections and understand the motives behind such evil acts. One day, while discussing my findings with an acquaintance in a local conspiracy group meeting, we stumbled upon a theory that seemed far-fetched at first but was strangely compelling and disturbingly plausible given the inexplicable events I had witnessed, 
Could it be possible that these black-eyed kids were dark beings or supernatural entities with origins much darker than we could possibly comprehend? As I continued on this journey to uncover the truth and make sense of it all, one thing became certain. Life will never be quite the same again. Lost in thought, I found myself reckoning with the nature of good and evil as I strolled through Crescent Forest, a popular spot in the USA for hiking and picnicking. The day was April 17, 2005, a date etched into my memory. My philosophical musings seemed fitting for someone named Ulysses Dimitri. As a journalist by trade, I prided myself on my ability to look beyond appearances and find deeper meaning in even the most seemingly mundane situations. My good friend and fellow journalist Luca Garrison accompanied me on this hike, periodically interrupting my thoughts with the kind of jest and humor one would only expect from a person as light-hearted as him. And the rumors? The strange disappearances mentioned in whispers around town? At that point, we didn't give them much attention. A couple of miles into our hike, we came across a backpack abandoned on the trail. When it couldn't be linked to any of the other hikers in the area, we decided to investigate further, with an exciting curiosity keeping us on our toes. A few yards away from the backpack, we found an ominous blood stain on the ground, but no body in sight. Luca took a puff from his cigarette and said off-handedly, Looks like some predator got their claws on an unfortunate soul. Or something worse, I remarked. As we delved deeper into the forest along an unnerving path with wild instincts guiding us, it became clear that we were walking in the midst of danger unbeknownst to ourselves at first. Suddenly, guttural growls echoed all around us, sending shivers down our spines. It wasn't too long before we caught a glimpse of a monstrous creature lurking behind the trees. Stalked by this hulking being, part man, part beast, we realized that each footprint and lingering snarl held a weight of horrors far greater than anything we could have imagined. Bigfoot, Sasquatch, or whatever name it went by, was no mere myth. Confronted by this reality, Luca and I sprinted back towards civilization, or at least we tried to. The terror-stricken faces of the victims we discovered along the way only added to our dread. Though many bore scratches and bruises, which suggested that they had encountered the creature during violent encounters, some exhaled ragged breaths as life slowly faded within them. Our escape was complicated by unnerving obstacles and near misses. At one point, Luca stumbled upon a tripwire rigged with a crude but functioning shotgun. He managed to disarm it before swinging around to examine the forest for signs of the beast that still breathed icy fear down our necks. Days later, after a series of harrowing twists of fate and grave misadventures, we made our escape from the clutches of Crescent Forest. The locals grudgingly accepted our claims of the menacing creature lurking beneath the shadows, whispering against their doubts. In a hushed tone one evening in a local tavern, an elderly hunter shared disturbing stories about a tall creature with dark matted fur that haunted these woods with its insatiable bloodlust. Stories seeped in cautionary myths and legends that no longer seemed so easily dismissible. The true identity behind those guttural growls and gnashing teeth still remains a mystery to us, but not one completely without answers. As the body count rose within those ominous woods, it became apparent there was indeed an evil lurking among those lost souls, as if born from mankind's worst fears and darkest sins. But as Ulysses Dimitri escaped with his life intact only to recount this tale in such chilling detail, perhaps there lies within the truth an even greater mystery yet to be solved.
In the years that followed our harrowing escape, Luca and I became obsessed with seeking out the creature that haunted the woods of Crescent Forest. Driven by a mix of fear, fascination, and journalistic curiosity, we embarked on a journey to unravel the origins of this terrifying being. Our investigations took us across the country, delving into obscure folklore and centuries-old legends whispered among tight-knit communities. What we unearthed was a dark tapestry of stories, weaving together glimpses of this monstrous figure. Time and again, we stumbled across tales that mirrored our own experience, sightings of a towering beast with wild eyes and an unquenchable hunger for violence. Despite our exhaustive research efforts, the roots of this elusive monster remain shrouded in mystery. Desperate for definitive answers, Luca and I redoubled our efforts and created a network of informants who would notify us of potential sightings or encounters. From hidden canyons to dense swamps, we pursued every lead in pursuit of clarity. But with each sighting or trace of evidence we uncovered, more questions arose than could be answered. In the quiet moments between investigations, doubt began to creep upon us like an insidious shadow. Perhaps this elusive beast would forever remain just out of reach, a tantalizing enigma lingering at the fringes of our consciousness. Yet in spite of the uncertainty that haunted us, the desire to uncover the truth only burned brighter within our souls. As our search began to consume us wholly, it became evident that what truly lay at its heart was not merely unearthing the identity or history of this otherworldly creature but rather an exploration into mankind's inherent struggle between good and evil. And as our quests wove seamlessly together in search of those answers buried deep within darkness's depths, the very line dividing man from monster seemed to dissolve softly, leaving only shimmering threads unbeknownst to most as one baffling enigma entwined forever with another. It was the strangest thing, picking up that bone fragment, while I was patrolling the park back in 2016. At the time, I didn't think much of it, just another oddity in a career that's full of them. My name is Neshoba Zephaniah Spires, and as a Sioux Park Ranger, I've seen some peculiar things throughout my years in the field. Long shifts spent alone can get tedious, so sometimes my friend Michael Cedarblade and I would sit at the guard's cabin and shoot the breeze. Most of our conversations were harmless, but inevitably, we would end up talking about that peculiar find, and Michael would share his latest theories on it. We were both curious lads with a morbid fascination for unsolved mysteries. One autumn evening, a call came through on our radios. Two experienced hikers had gone missing. My intuition told me that this wasn't just another case of people losing their way. I couldn't ignore this nagging feeling that the bone fragment had something to do with their disappearance. While surveying the area where they were last seen, Michael found several footprints near their tent site, an unsettling mix of human prints and claw marks from an unidentified creature. The crisp air suddenly started to smell foul and made my nose itch. We reported our findings and continued to search for any signs of life. Little did we know that we were being watched from the shadows by something we couldn't comprehend at that moment. It was after sundown when we encountered it, a monstrous creature camouflaged among the foliage, with bloodlust in its glowing yellow eyes. The moment it stepped out into the open, I recognized those claws from our earlier discovery. The tufted hair at its shoulders could only belong to one known creature, the Enfield Horror. The Enfield Horror lunged aggressively for a local camper who had wandered into our search area unknowingly. With quick thinking, I managed to push the civilian aside, and we scrambled for cover. 
The creature snarled with guttural fury, toying with us as it circled each hiding spot. The night was a harrowing ordeal, a desperate struggle as we tried to outsmart this bloodthirsty beast without much success. It seemed to have an innate sense of our position and anticipated every move we made. It wasn't until daylight started to break through that the Enfield horror finally retreated. We had been so focused on surviving that we didn't realize we had stumbled across the missing hikers. They had been mercilessly mauled by the creature, their faces twisted with terror. We called for backup and got the civilian out of there as quickly as possible. The devastating experience sparked discussions and debates among park rangers, local authorities, and paranormal enthusiasts alike. Residents nearby shared similar experiences, but most people remained skeptical of the supernatural explanations. For Michael and me, however, it was an ominous reminder that there are things out there that defy explanation, things that lurk in the shadows, waiting for their next victim. But despite everything that transpired in those horrific hours, we continued our duties as park rangers. The more people know about these hidden terrors, the better prepared they might be when their yellow eyes turn to them for their next kill. As the years went on, Michael and I dedicated our free time to researching and tracking the Enfield horror. We felt compelled not only to unmask the truth behind this enigmatic creature but also to keep others from sharing the same fate as the two hikers. Our little cabin became a makeshift investigation room filled with maps, newspaper clippings, and personal accounts from other witnesses. Our duties as park rangers provided us with unique access to areas within the park that weren't open to the public, allowing us to gather crucial information needed to piece together a pattern in the creature's behavior. With each new report or discovery of its tracks, we continued to refine our understanding of it as a dangerous dance between prey and predator. As frightening as it was to acknowledge, it was increasingly clear that the Enfield horror had taken up residence within our jurisdiction. The elusive creature fanned our curiosity but also kept us on constant alert while patrolling the parklands. Although there were no more deadly encounters, Mysterious animal deaths intensified near bodies of water, with unsettling traces being found at each scene. Blood-curdling howls echoing through forests now instilled a subtle but pervasive dread in our hearts. With vast amounts of time invested in this ongoing pursuit of knowledge and understanding, our friendship grew stronger, bound by our shared experiences and determination to uncover everything we could about this nightmarish entity. By diligently pursuing leads and sharing information about our discoveries through online forums or paranormal organizations, like-minded individuals provided yet more pieces of an ever-evolving puzzle that seemed equal parts natural and supernatural. As an uneasy peace settled over the park, its protectors and visitors alike expanded their vigilance against threats both seen and unseen. For Michael, Neshoba, and all who dare wander into those shadowed realms searching for answers, an unnerving truth would forever remain. If mankind is willing to look deep enough into nature's obscure corners, even the darkest of nightmares may suddenly and violently emerge, shattering our previously held notions of reality. Why did I ever think a road trip to Yosemite would be uneventful? The ticking of the dash clock felt louder than usual, echoing through the silence in my old, beat-up Ford Ranger. It was 2.37 a.m., and I was growing more anxious with every mile marker that passed. What was it about these backwoods that set me on edge? My name is Nathaniel Huxley. Everyone calls me Nat. A few years ago, after graduating with an art history degree, I became obsessed with nature photography. 
This passion led me to embark on this solitary expedition deep into the American wilderness, where I hoped to capture the essence of Yosemite's beauty. But what had felt like an adventure at first was gradually becoming unsettling. As my truck rumbled along the desolate road, I suddenly recognized another pair of headlights in my rearview mirror, gaining on me quickly. An old, rusted pickup truck eventually overtook me aggressively, momentarily blinding me as its high beams flooded my cabin, before disappearing around a bend up ahead. Freaking hillbillies! I muttered under my breath. I couldn't shake the feeling that something sinister lurked in these woods. There was just something off about this place. Curiosity peaked. I made my way to a local diner shortly after dawn and took a seat at the counter. What can I get you? said Trish, an amiable waitress who never failed to strike up a conversation. So, uh, what's up with the locals here? I asked hesitantly. They're good folks. Some are just a bit rough around the edges, she replied cautiously. Well, last night I had this crazy encounter with some guy in a beat-up truck, I told her hesitantly. Trish stiffened for a second but quickly regained her composure and said, Oh, honey, you must have just met a member of the McCammon clan. They've lived in these woods for generations. Old Murtaugh McCammon ain't got nothing better to do than cause trouble. Just keep your distance, and you'll be fine. Days went by with no further incident until I encountered Murtaugh himself. During an early morning stroll, I was snapping shots of a breathtaking sunrise when I heard heavy footsteps behind me. As I turned, my eyes locked on his disheveled appearance, dirt-streaked face, ragged overalls, and unkempt beard. You better not be looking for trouble round these parts, he growled menacingly. I tried to shake him off, but confusion mounted as, seemingly out of nowhere, Murta charged at me, roping my wrists together while wielding a rusted hatchet, his eyes fueled by inexplicable rage. Instinct took over as I struggled fiercely against his grasp. Eventually breaking free, we tussled along the forest floor until I gained the upper hand, relief washing over me only briefly as I realized that in our struggle, I had plunged my pocket knife into his chest. His raspy breath petered out amid gurgling accusations that I had disturbed there. Sacred ground. As I scrambled back to town, breathless and shocked by what had transpired, the townsfolk solemnly admitted that the McCammon family was a known menace, suspected of numerous brutal attacks and even abductions, an unspoken whispered terror that refused acknowledgement due to fear. The sheriff reassured me that my run-in with Murtaugh had been nothing short of self-defense. Nevertheless, it was little consolation for taking another man's life. A revelation that continues to haunt me as this gruesome encounter with darkness remains etched in my memory forever. After that fateful day, I became more hesitant about pursuing my passion for nature photography. The trauma took a toll on my spirit, casting an impenetrable shadow on what used to be a source of pure joy and inspiration. Though the beauty of Yosemite still captivated me, I could not separate those feelings from the terror that I had experienced on that seemingly ill-fated journey. Months went by, and the camera grew heavier in my hands, reluctant to document the world before me. In my attempts to escape that dark cloud, I reached out to local support groups and therapists, hoping to reclaim some part of my life that felt like it had slipped away with Murtaugh's final breath. Slowly but surely, Healing came as I began forging connections with others who had been touched by violence deep within their souls. It was in those circles that we shared our pains and burdens, gradually lessening them as we further understood that we were not alone in our suffering. As time elapsed, I learned to make peace with my past and even revisit Yosemite, this time accompanied by newfound friends from these support groups. 
The land of majestic peaks and cascading waterfalls no longer bore ominous shadows but instead echoed hope and resilience. In rebuilding our lives after tragedy, we found solace in nature's embrace, reminding us all that every sunrise marks a fresh start and giving us the strength to move forward together. It started at the Oakwood Lounge, a popular bar on the outskirts of a small town in Indiana. I'd been going there for years. It was my escape from the tedious routine of everyday life. The bar had always been a harbor where I could grab a drink, shoot some pool, and forget about my worries for a while. But everything changed that fateful Friday night. Bartender, can I have another beer, please? I asked as Matt, the bartender, slid a cold bottle across the counter. Slumping onto a stool next to me was Frankie Rashida, a co-worker who liked to frequent the bar as well. We were both electricians by trade. After talking shop and downing a couple more beers than we should have, we decided to head outside for some fresh air. We stumbled out into the warm summer night and noticed a group of kids huddled at the edge of the parking lot. Slightly drunk and curious, we approached them to strike up what we thought would be an amusing conversation. As I got closer to them, I saw something odd about their eyes. They were completely black. Hey there, said Frankie with his drunken charm. What are you kids doing hanging around this boring old bar? No offense. One of them replied coldly while staring blankly into our eyes with no emotion on their faces. He had strange black eyes as well, whiteless orbs that unnerved me to my core. The weirdness of their eyes threw us off, but it didn't completely dissuade us from talking to them. You kids ain't from around here, are you? I inquired. My charming introduction was met with monotonous silence. It wasn't until later, when my memory wandered back to this night, that it clicked. All throughout history, reports recounted children nearing strangers with pitch black eyes, otherwise referred to as black-eyed kids. I'd always dismiss the stories as mere urban legends, a product of overactive imaginations, but now I was experiencing them firsthand. It was in this surreal moment that we first started feeling the fear raising its ugly head inside of us. We didn't pay attention to the ominous feeling grabbing our guts. It wasn't long after that the situation turned from eerie to unthinkably sinister. The next day, terrified by my encounter and unable to shake off the disturbing image of those dark eyes, I sought out a researcher, Dr. Laura Holloway whom I managed to track down through various online forums. I remembered hearing her name previously while investigating cases involving supernatural or inexplicable phenomena. When she finally reached us on the phone, she listened cautiously as we recounted our experiences before revealing that there had been recent brutal incidents nearby relating to sightings of black-eyed kids. This knowledge made me shiver even more as all the threads began to intertwine inside my head. It was then that Frankie confided in me something he'd discovered about these encounters. Just today, Reese Crowther, a middle-aged man from Wisconsin, met with an unfortunate fate. He had been sharing his own terrifying experience with these ominous children. But just as he began detailing how he avoided disaster, they cunningly lured him back into their clutches. As the two of us digested this horrifying information, we realized we faced more than a strange, localized phenomenon. We were witnessing a chain reaction of deadly events that would unravel soon enough, right before our eyes. A few weeks later, I happened to bump into an old friend who used to serve on the local police force, Officer and Caulfield. After exchanging pleasantries, 
I finally shared my knowledge about what we'd discovered regarding black-eyed kids with her briefly. Caution caused me to withhold certain details. After all these years of investigating crimes and mysteries, she couldn't believe that something so bizarre would be hidden in plain sight. In conclusion, I must say that the mystery of the black-eyed kids remains unresolved. Our encounter with them became a grim testament to the fact that sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. Nowadays, whenever I drive by the Oakwood Lounge or think of that summer night, I can't shake the image of those kids and their haunting black eyes from engraving deeper into my mind. For those who don't believe, I understand. It's always easier to look away from things that terrify us or seem otherworldly. But whatever you do, if you ever find yourself in front of those pitch black, soulless eyes, I urge you to trust your gut instinct and distance yourself as quickly as possible. Once you've caught their attention, it's easy to be drawn into the darkness of their mysterious world. A world that may hold nightmares far worse than anything our rational minds can comprehend or explain. So if you ever feel that heavy weight of unease, the gut-twisting sensation that screams danger, listen closely and act accordingly. As for me, I'll continue my search for answers, hoping against hope that there will come a day when we can finally understand and possibly even protect ourselves from the ominous presence of the black-eyed kids. Sometimes I wonder if we're all just pawns in a game, each of us moving according to an invisible hand. But when that game turns bloody, like my story did, well, that's when you buckle up and hold on tight. The saga began at a bustling cafe in downtown Portland, Oregon. It was about three o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon, the 5th of October, and I was there with a college buddy named Ezra Steinberg. We hadn't seen each other in years, but fate decided to throw us together that day. Soon enough, we got lost in conversation, reminiscing about our wilder days. Ezra was an enigmatic guy, good-looking but rough around the edges. He had an undeniable charm that could make anyone feel like they'd known him for years. In fact, it was that charm that saved our asses later on. We spent hours at the cafe catching up before deciding to head out for a little fresh air. We strolled through downtown Portland towards Forest Park, a place both beautiful and eerily quiet despite being so close to the city. As daylight turned to dusk, we stumbled upon a hidden clearing deep within the park. That's when it happened. Ezra found a mutilated body lying on the ground, surrounded by pools of crimson blood. My heart pounded as I tried to process what lay before me. It appeared as if the flesh had been torn from the bones somehow. The violence of it all sent an icy chill down my spine. Trying to keep my composure, I dialed 911 while Ezra inspected the grisly scene looking for any clues as to who could have done this. The police arrived shortly after and asked questions about what led us there. Meanwhile, detectives searched the area for evidence. But soon enough, more bodies were found with similar injuries in nearby woods. Panic spread among locals while authorities desperately searched for answers. It wasn't long before whispers of a bazaar otherworldly creature filled the air. Ezra, always the colorful creative, suggested it was Bigfoot, that infamous legend ingrained in local folklore. I laughed him off at first, but a part of me couldn't deny there was something inexplicable happening. Deciding to take matters into our own hands, we started our own investigation and reached out to witnesses. An old hunter named Frank claimed he saw a beast, a creature unlike any animal he'd ever known. With black eyes, grotesquely large limbs, and thick fur, it left an undeniable stench in its wake that sent animals fleeing. 
Two weeks later, Ezra and I found ourselves hunting for this elusive figure in the dead of night. We walked through the dense forest armed with flashlights and rifles, every sound and shadow heightening our senses. I couldn't help but wonder if it was hunting us too. Unbeknownst to us at the time, news had spread about our quest for the monster, and the local press had dubbed us heroes chasing the unknown. But as we wandered deeper into the woods, that heroic illusion became disturbingly shattered. We stumbled on another scene of carnage. A woman's lifeless body lay mutilated and drained of blood like all preceding victims. It was then that I truly realized that we were dealing with a creature capable of immense violence. We had to either stop this thing or die trying. Our quest became increasingly frantic as days bled into nights. We dedicated every waking hour to uncovering this monster's origins. Finally, we found someone who'd seen what happened, an eccentric homeless man named Larry Charles. He revealed that on the night of the full moon, he'd seen the creature transform from man into beast, right before his very eyes. The man's name was Howard Longview. Seeking evidence for Larry's story led us to Howard's isolated cottage deep in the woods. There we found countless disturbing records of his lifelong journey with this horrific transformation, along with his struggle and failure to contain it. With bated breath and determination, we cornered him and brought an end to his monstrous reign. The police confirmed Larry's account soon after, and rumors of monsters faded away, leaving Portland to return to its bustling normalcy. To this day, I can't shake that gut-wrenching feeling I got when we finally faced the monster in the flesh. But one thing is certain. Life's invisible hand had certainly thrown me and Ezra into an unexpected game. My life was forever changed after that harrowing experience, marked by an indelible scar of fear and vulnerability in the face of the evil that lurks in the shadows of our world. I returned to my mundane existence, quietly grateful for the chance to feel safe again, while Ezra continued to pursue a life rooted in the extraordinary. He'd found his calling, joining a secret society sworn to protect humanity against malevolent supernatural creatures. The bond between us had grown strong, even powerful, and once in a while we'd exchange stories about our respective lives, his thrilling tales of unknown horrors leaving me grateful for my own predictable existence. As for me, I slowly filled my days with more routine activities. Teaching high school history became my comfort, allowing me a sense of control over at least one aspect of reality. Yet occasionally, as I lectured on great wars and victories in our human past, I couldn't help but feel an eerie connection to our own monstrous struggle amidst Forest Park's tangled woods. And still, every so often, I find myself tracing back through old news stories or getting lost in whispered rumors and folklore surrounding that dark chapter. The legend of Howard Longview now lives on as a testament to life's enigmatic nature, reminding us that often the most gripping tales lie beneath a seemingly calm surface. In time, something awakened within me. The realization that sometimes we must face our own fears to truly uncover the strength buried deep within us all. Those sleepless nights spent chasing monsters would forever serve as a sobering reminder that beasts lurked far beyond the edges of fairy tales. We'd stepped into their world and emerged victorious, yet haunted by unspeakable memories still lingering like shadows from a forgotten nightmare. For Ezra and me, Forever united by this shared brush with darkness, life was never quite the same again. Why did I ever think that taking a solo trip to the backwoods of Montana was a good idea? I mean, sure. 
the opportunity for some peaceful introspection and aesthetic nature photography was tempting, but at what cost? My name is Maxon Redwood. I'm 29, a freelance writer, and ironically afraid of the woods. It all started when my friends bailed on our highly anticipated hiking trip. They claimed it was due to work or family matters, but I couldn't shake the nagging suspicion that they just wanted an excuse to avoid me. It was a chilly Friday morning when I set off alone, armed with my camping gear and camera. As I walked through the dense forest, I couldn't help but feel like someone or something was watching me. My instincts told me to head back to civilization, but my stubbornness pushed me further into the wilderness. Around noon, I met Hank Huckerton in a small clearing near a rickety old cabin. He introduced himself as a local hunter who had roamed these parts for years. He seemed harmless at first, just another outdoorsman who knew the lay of the land. I've never seen you round here before. Hank mentioned casually while offering me a swig from his flask. You sure picked one hell of a time for visiting Dot. Wait, what do you mean? I asked hesitantly. Hank's face darkened with concern as he leaned in close and whispered ominously about a series of strange occurrences that had befallen this area lately. Grizzly findings of mutilated animals and unidentifiable human remains deep within these very woods. Feeling unsettled and alarmed by Hank's disclosure, I bid him farewell haphazardly and continued my hike alone, unable to shake every rustle and every crunch beneath my boots that seemed to grow louder by the second. It wasn't long before I stumbled upon a gruesome sight myself. A gutted deer carcass displayed disturbingly across the branches of an old, gnarled tree. Seized with horror, I kept going, desperate to put as much distance as possible between myself and that unnerving discovery. Suddenly, it felt like someone was tailing me through the shadows, following my every move and leaving unseen threats in their wake. That sense of danger heightened when I found a crudely drawn map tucked beneath a rock a chilling reminder that I was being watched. Hours later, darkness fell upon the forest and my hastily set up campsite. I lay in my tent, clutching a hunting knife with white knuckles, as paranoia overwhelmed me. The smallest noises made me jump. My mind constructed sinister twists from nothing but shadows and broken twigs, drowning me in primal fear. But it wasn't until the screams began that everything unraveled. The blood-curdling cries echoed through the night, tearing into my psyche. Desperation clawed at my chest as the wooden crunches of heavy footsteps approached, punctuated by panting breaths and strings of barely coherent curses. My heart raced as the voice drew closer. It belonged to no one else but Hank Huckerton himself. A shattering revelation hit me just before he lunged towards my tent. That map and its marked locations were where I'd been earlier. It wasn't just anyone stalking me through these woods. It was that seemingly innocuous local hunter who'd sent unsuspecting victims into his twisted trap for God knows how long. I managed to escape through the back of my tent just in time and bolted blindly into the blackened woods. Hank's enraged bellows pursued me relentlessly as he hunted his prey across this nightmare landscape, his deranged taunts positioning him as a ruthless predator closing in on his frightened quarry. After a harrowing chase shrouded in darkness and fear, I miraculously stumbled upon the old cabin Hank described earlier. Inside were haunting relics of his twisted exploits, newspaper clippings and polaroids of long-lost victims personal belongings, and trophies from his grotesque conquests. Armed with this damning evidence, I managed to hide until sunrise before returning to my car and making a mad dash out of that hellish nightmare. It took days for the authorities to catch up with Hank Huckerton, but they eventually found him holed up in a hidden location deep within the woods. 
The man was responsible for countless unspeakable atrocities and had become something less than human over time, a shell of the person he once was, fueled solely by his twisted desires and lust for blood. His trial and eventual incarceration brought some semblance of justice for those he had tormented and slain, though nothing could truly right the unspeakable wrongs he had committed. For me, the experience left scars that will never fully heal, both physical and emotional. I'll carry the memory of that horrific ordeal with me for the rest of my days, a constant reminder to trust my instincts and never underestimate the darkness hidden beneath seemingly benign surfaces. Life returned to some level of normalcy, but no amount of time can erase the chilling imprint left by my harrowing encounter with Hank Huckerton in those godforsaken woods of Montana.